evening. <clears throat> welcome to the special meeting for six o'clock. I'd like to welcome everyone um, to the special meeting to the town council, especially uh, Attorney Coppola and uh, your assistant attorney Stutter. Uh, welcome. Uh, you're here tonight to discuss the independent review and evaluation of the 2021 reevaluation process. Um, attorney Coppola, the, the floor is going to be yours first. And following uh, your presentation, uh, I'd like to hear from the manager and the town attorney, and then the town council will then ask questions at that point. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having oh, us. Excuse me. Uh, okay, no, I don't mind at all. First of all, welcome. Yeah. Again, as one of the liaisons, a welcome to Enfield, welcome back to Enfield, and welcome to Enfield. I just want to sort of, before you get into your presentation again, I want to give my opinion of this process, and then again, we'll let the council when they're ready to, to ask questions. Again, I think it was a worthwhile process. I think it was worth the, what we did because this is a very important thing when it comes to reevaluation, how it affects every taxpayer. I think this was a very worthwhile process. I also think it was a fair process. All I can go by is what I was involved in. And I want to give you, I think you were straightforward with us, which is what I asked. And I asked for an independent review. And that's what I, what I think we have. It'll be up to each counselor to decide how they want to move forward with this and based on the information. But in my opinion, I think this was fair. I think you were fair to me. You answered my questions. And I always thought you were, uh, again, open and willing to discuss, you know, as we talked about, you know, the investigation over the last eight, nine year, uh, months. And I also think, again, this is a worthwhile process. So thank you, and the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, for the record, Mario Coppola, uh, Law Offices of Birch and Moses in uh, Milford and Westport, Connecticut. I'm here this evening with my colleague, Matt Studer, who assisted me with the uh, investigation and the report that we issued. So uh, our law firm, Birch and Moses, was hired by the town to conduct an independent review and evaluation of issues pertaining to the town's 2021 revaluation process and a board of assessment appeals hearings. Uh, our, uh, over the course of several months, we conducted a thorough review. Throughout that review, we compiled uh, an official record, uh, which is here this evening with me in the three bankers boxes to the left. Uh, the uh, official record um, ultimately comprises hundreds of documents and which total over 10,000 pages. They are uh, provided in binders, um, which are in each uh, page is bait stamped to provide identification for the uh, page uh, of each document. And uh, my understanding is that these records will be uh, available in the town clerk's office. So if any member of the public wants to review the the full record, they, and somebody has a lot of time on their hands this summer, they have the, uh, the ability to go to the town clerk's office and, and review those documents. However, what we did, what we did uh, in order to assist everybody with reviewing the record was we compiled an appendix of 20 documents that we thought were most relevant uh, to reference when reading our report. And, and that appendix was provided in hard copy along with the report to everyone on the council to those uh, involved with the revaluation process, including the assessor and the Board of Assessment Appeals members. And my understanding is that uh, there, are, there have been links posted for the public uh, uh, where they could uh, review an electronic copy of the report and the, the appendix of all the documents. A critical component of our review was also interviewing individuals involved with the revaluation and BAA process. Um, over a, a number of months, we conducted 15 interviews of town officials and other interested persons. The scope of our review was limited to whether the uh, appropriate entities and individuals involved with the 21 revaluation and BA appeals adhere to the law and to generally accepted practices and proper procedure. The report that we issued summarized the conduct of parties involved with the 21 revaluation and identified thematic issues areas of concern and suggested areas where there could be improvement. The report highlighted individual cases that were illustrative of a general theme or area of concern or which clearly exceeded or conflicted with Connecticut law. In the report, we examined the work of the revaluation company, the assessor, and the Board of Assessment Appeals. First, with regard to the revaluation company, 
concerns were raised about the revaluation process, particularly the BA appeals. Uh, Vision Government Solutions was the company that performed the 21 revaluation. The Connecticut Office of Policy and Management reviewed Vision's revaluation report and certified the newly established values in the, in the revaluation on the 2021 grant list. Vision's work uh, in the 21 revaluation satisfied all state requirements. The Connecticut Office of Policy and Management did not find any errors with Vision's work in Enfield. We concluded the 21 revaluation was properly conducted in accordance with accepted standards for the mass appraisal of property. There was nothing abnormal about Vision's 21 revaluation program in Enfield. Allegations that Vision's work was somehow flawed or unsubstantiated and without merit. Second, with regard to the assessor, the BA and some members of the public raised concerns regarding the assessor, Todd Helms, uh, and his, particularly his work during the 21 revaluation. We concluded that uh, Mr. Helms generally complied with his statutory mandates and adhered to accepted best practices. He implemented new policies and practices to ensure that the grand list accurately reflects all the taxable property in the town. While we find that Mr. Helms mostly complied with the law and fulfilled the duties of his office in good faith, there were some interpersonal shortcomings, uh, which at, at various times in his interviews he recognized. Uh, the office of the assessor is required to engage with the public and to convey assessment information to the town's taxpayers in a timely and clear in a clear manner. In the future, and particularly during the next upcoming townwide revaluation, uh, we suggest that the assessor endeavor to engage early and often with the community, particularly with the farming and agricultural community, to ensure the taxpayers are aware of their individual responsibilities and reporting obligations and feel as though their concerns have been acknowledged and addressed by the town. With regard to the uh, Board of Assessment Appeals, uh, our report did not address each and every appeal on a case-by-case -case basis that the Board of Assessment Appeals uh, um, adjudicated during their process, nor did uh, it address differences in the opinions of value between the BA's decision and, and ultimately what the assessor's initial value was uh, with regard to a property that was under appeal before the Board of Assessment Appeals. Such an analysis would have exceeded the scope of our report. However, there were several instances where the BAA um, improperly exempted real estate or reduced the value of real estate to zero, in effect, an illegal de facto exemption, um, which we highlighted in the report. There were three cases that were examples of this practice, which are addressed in detail at pages 58 to 66 of the report. Um, also, with regard to the Board of Assessment Appeals, um, when we first got involved, there was a uh, an issue or a conflict, I should say, with regard to the BA records. The BA had decided to uh, retain uh, their records um, outside of town hall. The BA records were eventually returned by the BA to the town. Um, we concluded uh, that the BA is a public agency. The documents maintained by the BA are public records, and uh, those records should be maintained in town hall and readily available at all times for the public. At the end of our report, we endeavored to provide you with recommendations and best practices for moving forward. And I can't reiterate enough how important it is, I think, to move forward. Hopefully, the report was helpful in identifying some issues uh, and, and, and identifying best practices. And I hope that everybody could move forward um, in a productive manner. Uh, just to highlight some of those uh, recommendations and best practices, which are in section 10 of the report, pages 70 to 72. Um, first, it's, it's neither illegal nor improper for the assessor to attend BA appeal hearings. Those uh, <coughs> BA hearings are public. However, given the contentious atmosphere in Enfield, we recommend that the assessor refrain from attending future BA appeal meetings. Second, the town has the right to record the hearings uh, of the Board of Assessment Appeals. However, decisions regarding those, uh, the uh, recording of those BA hearings, we believe should be left to the members of the BAA. And our understanding is that the BA members do not think it's necessary to uh, tape their hearings, and, and therefore we think that the decision should, should rest with the Board of Assessment Appeals. Uh, third, all the BA documents must be retained in town hall, as I spoke about earlier. Um, 
Fourth, uh, absent a compelling need, the BAA should not hold the public, public meetings after April 30th, excluding, obviously, the September motor vehicle appeal hearings. Uh, next, the town council should consider a limited charter revision or a amendment uh, to your ordinances, if possible, uh, in order to uh, permit the appointment of alternate members to the Board of Assessment Appeals. Next, the Board of Assessment Appeals should refrain from publishing minutes or drafting uh, any memoranda to minutes which address the qualifications of town employees, elected or appointed officials, the revaluation company, or matters of law, or other issues beyond the scope of their statutory jurisdiction. The, uh, we recommend that the assessor should coordinate with the town's agricultural commission and or Connecticut Farm Bureau to disseminate information to and engage with the town's farming and agricultural community. The town may consider holding an annual PA 490 public information session, a Q&A essentially, uh, for the benefit of the town's uh, farmers. We recommend that new BA members uh, attend an annual training seminar conducted by the town attorney or a reputable organization such as the Connecticut Association of Assessing Officers. Veteran BA members should be encouraged to attend the same annual seminar. Um, and all members of the BA should be provided with a copy of the BA handbook that is produced by the Connecticut Association of Assessing Officers. Uh, the BA should not attempt to interpret legal documents during its hearings. Uh, one best practice we suggest is that uh, if the BA has questions or concerns regarding the applicability or interpretation of a legal document, that the BA should consult with the town attorney. And lastly, we uh, recommend that the assessor and BAA um, work to, uh, uh, to try to, to work uh, cooperatively and communicate professionally going forward. So thank you for taking the time to hear some highlights from, from our report, and uh, we're here to answer any questions that you may have as well. All right, well, th thank you very much. Thank you for your time and effort that you've done throughout these last several months uh, in putting all this together and doing all of your interviews with, uh, I believe it's the 15 people that you had to interview and uh, come up with your final report. But I, before we open it up to the council, I will bring it to uh, the town manager, then uh, the town attorney. Good evening. There's not much for me to add at this point other than to say that from the standpoint of the town manager's office, we're looking at this as a roadmap in conjunction with the town attorney and the assessment and tax collection staff. So as we move forward, there are several recommendations that we're going to take point on in making sure that they get implemented. Um, this report is brand new. We all received it, you know, within the last five days. And my recommendation would be to continue to digest it, to reflect upon it, and to come up with your own list of concerns that we could then put together and ensure that when I meet with the staff, that they are understanding of the position of the town council as the policy making body and what your priorities are moving forward. We obviously have a little bit of some breathing room until the next revaluation, which I think is a good thing because over the next three years, the strengthening of community collaborations, communications, um, written communications, which they didn't do enough of last year because of being short staffed, uh, you know, and by those I mean noticing of important timelines, personal property declarations, you know, all of those things that have deadlines associated with them, we can bulk up what happens here and how we communicate. So I think that there's a lot of great information here. And from my standpoint of Working with John Wilcox, who is the direct supervisor, we're going to continue to do what we've been doing, which is have robust communications with the staff. And we are obviously open to any input that the town council would have in terms of how you want us to go about using this roadmap in order to make improvements continuously, as we do in all departments, in order to better serve the taxpayers. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'll be brief because I think the real utility of tonight is for you councilors to have an, an opportunity to question, uh, to have a question and answer session with Attorney Coppola. But uh, I would re be remiss if I didn't note that, I, I mean, I do think the report speaks for itself. It's thorough, fair, balanced, objective. It's fact-based. It's transparent. It's based on a review of the entire record, 10,600 pages, 15 interviews. It's what I think you all wanted when you started hearing from your constituents. 
Um, just reading the report, you can see there's obvious subject matter expertise from the, author, uh, the authors. And so um, I don't want to take any more uh, of your time. I'll cede my time so that you counselors can um, ask questions of the attorneys. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll open up the questions. Do we have questions uh, from anybody up here at the council? Any questions? Uh, Councilor Nelson. I too just wanted to say thank you um, for your hard work and putting together a stellar report for us. Uh, very detailed, very, you know, to the point and very factual. And I just wanted to commend you for that. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Nelson. Um, I too want to thank you for the report. I think it was pretty thorough and in depth. Um, I, I believe you came with the same conclusion that I had had just from sitting in certain meetings with both sides. Um, I think that um, a lot of it is communication and a lot of it falls on the town council that we need to adopt the 490 statute for the town of Enfield, which would eliminate a lot of the problems that um, are being sent to the BAA because the assessor's right in what he's doing. The BAA is following past precedents and all of that could be avoided if the council would just set a 490 um, statute in the town. And then the last thing I want to say is this, this report, one thing I didn't like about the report is um, there were certain comments in this report made by certain people that, um, that really diminished the character of the previous assessor which I don't appreciate. She's a retired employee. She's got many, many years, and it's not from you. Um, but from one of the people you interviewed, and it's in here, she's got many, many years with this town, um, and she dealt well with the people. Everybody does their job different. So our new assessor may have an issue with the old assessor, the BAA. You know, th that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the way I see her being perceived in this is 100% wrong and to try to push the problems we're having today on a previous employee is absolutely ridiculous. And I wanna publicly apologize to her. Her name shouldn't even be in this book. She retired, she's gone, and she served Enfield well. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Okay, th thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Scala. Um, uh, you're probably going to get 11 thank yous, but we very much appreciate um, this report. A long time coming, um, very anticipated um, for someone or for most of us who weren't liaisons who knew absolutely nothing but the few um, updates that the liaisons gave the counselors. This is a lot um, to digest, and I've read it twice. So I'm going to read it a couple of more times, um, but I do appreciate the factualness of it and um, the thoroughness. One question I did have is, you said you interviewed 15 people. When you started this process, were you, were you able to interview sort of everybody that you set out to interview in the process? Good question. Uh, for the most part, yes. There were a few uh, individuals whom we, uh, who I reached out to for interviews. and we, we didn't have an opportunity to interview. Uh, for example, I believe I spoke with counsel for um, one or, uh, organization, um, one nonprofit. I don't want to say because I don't want to say the wrong name, but it was one of the nonprofits uh, that had had their exemption taken away, which may have been returned. So I had spoken to counsel for that organization, and um, he said that they they would let me know if they would if anybody would like to be interviewed from that organization. I think that happened with a couple uh, of. Uh, of, of the organizations that had had issues with their exemption being taken away. But for the most part, everybody uh, that I asked uh, to interview uh, agreed to be interviewed, including the former assessor, uh, Ms. Fromont, who was delightful and who we do know in, in the report um, uh, was uh, had a great reputation in the town for doing a good job as the assessor. And she was very helpful, quite frankly, in her interview. Um, so for the most part, you know, everybody we, we um, reached out to uh, was uh, nice enough to participate in the process, including two tax assessors um, on the other side of the state who had no relationship or uh, with, with the assessor. Um, we felt would be unbiased and, and helpful to get their perspective and who also volunteered their time to be interviewed as well. 
um, it was one thing that the council liaisons were helpful with was uh, giving some direction as to uh, people who we may want to interview. And um, we were also receptive to interviewing anybody who wanted to be interviewed. So if, the, if council liaisons knew of somebody in town who wanted to be interviewed, they would let us know. And, and we, we were more than happy to interview that person as well. OK. Thank you. I appreciate it. OK, thank you. Councilor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your time today. Um, I did want to ask some, some general questions as well as some specific questions. Um, you know, the way I viewed this investigation was uh, in lieu of the council using its, its section or chapter three, section eight investigative powers to kind of more understand this issue, definitely pros and cons. I think it's helpful to have such an in-depth investigation, but I did want to ask some questions to better understand that. Um, so did you end up providing the transcripts uh, to the town and those might be shared of some of the interviews that were done. Yes, the transcripts of any of the interviews were uh, provided as part of the record. Um, and again, the full record is here to the left of me. It's available in the town clerk's office. My recollection was that the, uh, the transcripts of interviews was probably in the last binder um, of bait stamped uh, pages um, that, that are designated with the Enfield bait stamp. Just so you know, um, when we were first engaged in the process, um, the BA records, I think before they came back to town hall, um, ended up in my office. We, we, we obtained the, those, all the BA records and um, had them all uh, organized and bait stamped and copied um, and uh, provided the town with uh, an electronic uh, and, and hard copy of all those records. So I think the, the first set of records, which I think is around uh, BA 0001 to I don't know, around 6,000, uh, th that's the first part of the record. And then the second part of the record is the Enfield um, uh, bait stamp records, which did it start at one? I think it started, yeah, so it started from one to around 4,000. And uh, that's, that's all here in the record. Um, we didn't get transcripts of all the interviews. We, we, we at first didn't, we're trying not to get transcripts because of the cost. Um, we endeavored to keep the costs down as much as possible. Um, representing multiple municipalities, I am certainly cognizant of, 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 of budgetary constraints and, and concern of costs. Um, so we ended up getting a uh, um, someone that we use in some of the other towns uh, that I work with um, to do the transcripts at a significantly lower hourly rate. Um, and so we, we were able to reduce the cost of the, uh, for those transcripts. Probably we were talking about this earlier today by about twenty thousand. I think we spent about fifty five hundred total for the transcripts and estimated if we use a uh, um, uh, a company that would typically do a transcript for a deposition, adding up what their costs would be, we estimated it would be over twenty five thousand. So we saved a significant portion, a significant amount of costs by using somebody who uh, we use in New Canaan and Norwalk. Um, and who was um, willing to provide us with the same rate for Enfield that she charges to those communities. Um, and our IT staff in my office at no charge to the town worked with her to help convert the files so that she was able to, um, to, uh, to do the transcripts in a, in a, in a time effective manner. Um, with that being said, we had transcripts for most of the interviews, but not all of them. There, there was, we, we also did attempt to uh, tape all the interviews um, on Zoom, and some of some of the uh, so, some of the taping, you know, wasn't wasn't perfect uh, based on just you know what you get when you tape on Zoom. But it was, uh, but we also did that as well with regard to the interviews. All right, thank you. Um, so I, I so there's one taxpayer interviewed as part of this investigation. Could you explain your thought process with not interviewing more specifically those that appealed, uh, or a subset of those some that appealed? Part of the thinking, well. well uh, the council liaisons pro uh, provided me with uh, names of folks who were interested in being interviewed. So um, I don't, I don't know who's here in Enfield. And I did ask uh, uh, during the uh, uh, the meetings with council liaison if there are taxpayers who would like to be interviewed or who you think should be interviewed. Please let me know. So that's how we ended up with one taxpayer. Um, certainly, we were willing to uh, to interview as many as uh, the council liaisons thought was appropriate. Okay. Um, additionally, um, the report doesn't really touch on, uh, I think, a concern that was raised and brought to your attention, or at least liaison's attention, uh, regarding uh, letters that were sent out for reversals of BAA decisions while the investigation was pending. Uh, could you explain why you didn't touch on that issue? Uh, I think we actually did. 
it's in the report. Uh, you know where? Uh, well, it's a 72-page report. I, I, That's I don't okay. know the exact page number, but my, yep. my recollection was that we did, uh, in fact, address that issue and in, in that uh, the assessor was able to um, not overturn the decisions, but rather um, change the, uh, come to a new conclusion of value that was different than the BAA when, uh, at the next grand list here. So, for example, um, the BAA issued a decision for the 21 grand list. Um, the assessor, to the uh, best of my recollection, didn't necessarily uh, overturn the decision on the uh, that the BA made on the 21 grand list, but rather uh, when he valued the same property on the 22 grand list um, in his watchtower role um, as promulgated in, uh, I think it's Connecticut General Statute, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, 12-55, um, assessed the property for what he believed the, the proper value to be and may have come to a different conclusion for the following grand list year, but he didn't over he didn't uh, change any decisions that the Board of Assessment Appeals made for a particular grand list year. Uh, I think in particular the concern was individuals who had their appeals overturned uh, and then uh, had their original assessed amount increased. There was a concern that I think that was communicated regarding that being a, a possibly vindictive action, and I wanted to maybe get an, in, an answer on to whether that was looked into because that's concerning. Yes, we review uh, any information that was provided to us. We reviewed, including uh, the board, your board of assessment appeals chair. I believe uh, provided us with information about uh, uh, valuations made on the twenty-two grand list, uh, which were uh, not consistent with decisions that the BA made, may have made on the prior twenty-one grand list. And we do we did review um, the information provided and. Um, and we did uh, opine as to that in the report uh, as to the assessor's ability to value um, uh, the grand list uh, in, in the following year. Um, the assessor is uh, obligated to um, sign off on the grand list and to um, fill out certain forms and, and uh, make certain certifications under oath to the Connecticut Office of Policy and Management um, when he or she signs off on a grand list year um, at the end of January, or if there's an extension, the end of February each year. Okay, thank you. Um, so in, in characterizing the, the scope and, and limitations of the report, I think you noted it wasn't possible to uh, determine whether farmland or forest land was properly classified without reviewing individual cases. Is that right? Not exactly. I, I think with regard to farmland and forest land, um, we... Uh, provided a review of um, the procedures administered by the assessor um, and determined the, um, the uh, legality and uh, properness of those procedures. So, for example, with, um, we talk about the, the PA 490 exemptions, um, Councilman Nelson mentioned uh, open space, and he aptly pointed out that if the town uh, is to adopt a, an ordinance, um, for open space, then that would allow um, properties that have previously been designated uh, on, on your, in your POCD as open space and may have previously been granted exemptions to going forward be able to um, apply to the town for those exemptions. Uh, so there we found that the assessor um, properly uh, um, took away uh, open space designations or open space uh, exemptions that um, probably shouldn't have been provided in the past um, and, and denied any applications for open space um, on the 21 grand list. With regard to, to farmland um, and forest land, um, one major issue was uh, that the assessor reviewed um, the status of uh, those properties which had had the exemption for forest land and forest land uh, and, uh, and or farmland and he removed the exemptions where there was no application on file uh, for the exemption. And um, in, in some instances, there were transfers uh, of ownership, um, some of which may have actually um, qualified uh, for exemption under a different provision of the Connecticut General Statutes, which we uh, elaborate on in the report, but nonetheless required a new application to be filed. Um, and there were some other instances uh, 
where we um, went through his general practice with regard to farmland, um, such as uh, his treatment of uh, woodland parcels, and he had had a bright line rule that you know if, if it wasn't part of the uh, if the woodland wasn't part of the parcel that it wouldn't receive exemption. We determined that that was not a best that that's not the best practice, and that the best practice is to not apply that ru a rule that he he thought was a best practice. Um, and uh, again, with farm farmland, he uh, had made some he had made changes to different farmland uh, properties uh, with regard to the uh, the grade. So, for example, went from tillable uh, C to tillable A based on what he believed to high to be a higher and better use than the actual use, and and we determined that was not a best practice, and that going forward. Um, he shouldn't make that, those type of changes unless he has an expert report, such as from a soil scientist, to um, to confirm that that conclusion. Um, so uh, we addressed in general the way he handled um, applications uh, for farmland, forest land, and open space. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, there may were there any specific properties that we addressed as far as what the assessor did. Uh, no, I would say. We, we identified issues that Mario just identified. We didn't go through each application and apply the criteria that, that the assessors um, directed to apply under 12107C. Um, and that criteria is laid out on page 15 of our report. Those are the different factors that the assessors required to look at to determine whether a parcel qualifies as farmland under Public Act 490. Okay, uh, how many applications, or excuse me, how many uh, properties with PA 490 exemptions uh, did you look at, either in general or ones that were appealed, approximately? My recollection was that in general it was around, uh, the, the number 77 comes to mind as to the total number of the applications at issue. Um, for example, uh, with regard to um, those applications where there was a where the assessor removed an exemption for forest land or farmland because there was not an application on file that had been filed for the exemption. Uh, my recollection was that we uh, then reviewed the 14, 14 appeals uh, of those properties that w went to the Board of Assessment Appeals in 2021 and, and determined that it was improper for the BA to um, essentially uh, um, provide that exemption for those 14 properties. So, for example, we did there look at the, those 14 properties uh, that were then appealed to the BAA. But I would say in general we looked at, I think, all the applications uh, for exemption that were at issue in the 21 grand list. Okay, and analyze them for whether or not they met the criteria for PA 490? We, we, we looked generally at the, the process that the uh, uh, underwent by the assessor. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we went in. A, we, we we did performed a detailed case by case analysis of of all of those proper of all of those properties. Okay, yeah. The, the, really, what I'm getting at is, you know, I want to make sure that uh, the uh, report and investigation are understood for what they are. You know, uh, page two, you talk about the scope of that, and I don't want to necessarily think of it as a uh, a blessing of every single uh, determination of PA 490 exemptions or a criticism of every uh, PA 490 uh, exemption. Is that fair to say? I guess so. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate you bearing with me here. Um, so uh, you also stated that Helms generally complied with his statutory mandates and adhered to best practices, uh, as well as he mostly complied with the law. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, you also talk about the prior assessor as being risk adverse. Well, it, it was uh, um, a statement made by uh, someone in one of the interviews. Okay. Would you that, agree with that? I, I, yes, I would, I would say so. Okay. Um, so, I mean, personally, I expect tax assessors to, to comply with the law more than they don't. Um, you know, I'm particularly concerned, having read this and also having heard a lot of examples prior to this investigation starting, about um, instances where the law uh, wasn't followed that lead to violations of tax law as they apply to residents and as they apply to potential lawsuits. I think that's a big concern. I'm sure other counselors share that. Uh, especially because you stated uh, in the report uh, about the assessor having adopted assessment practices that have been that have been justly characterized as aggressive, is that a statement that you made in the report? 
well, if it's in the report, if you're, if you're reading from the report, then yeah, it says just, it in the report. I don't, I, I haven't memorized every statement I made sure. in a report, but if you're repeating something from the report, if it says it in the report, then I, then yes. We I just don't want to be unfair. I, you know, let me know. If well, whatever me the if report wrong. says we stand by. Um, what I would say to you is, is that um, no assess, uh, um, on Thursday, I'm going to be uh, uh, teaching a course to the assessor's uh, school where most of the assessors are at it this week up at UConn. Uh, no assessor in Connecticut uh, performs their job perfectly um, every day uh, during their career. And, um, you know, all of us make mistakes in the work we do. I could tell you my wife reminds me on a daily basis things that I do wrong. Um, and, and I think that, you know, uh, for example, I'm the corporation counsel for the city of Norwalk. And if somebody performed a similar type of review on my work for the city of Norwalk as corporation counsel for the last year, uh, they could probably find some instances in which um, I didn't adhere to best practices as a corporation counsel or town attorney and could have done things better. And I think that's the same thing for the assessor here. Uh, with regard to assessors, in my experience, having represented uh, numerous municipalities in Connecticut for um, the better part of 15 years, um, quite often we'll review a, uh, a, a, a case and um, quite often we'll, we'll determine that the assessor uh, didn't value the prop that some part of the assessor's uh, valuation of the property uh, isn't correct, uh, could have been done better. Um, that's, that's why uh, you know, we're really busy. We have a very busy practice in, in, in valuation work because um, it's somewhat of an imperfect science. And so, um, and, and, and this may come as a shock to some of you, but um, the laws in the state of Connecticut are not written perfectly. And I would say that to my friends in the legislature, you know, the reality is that um, some of the statutes could be better written. And so, um, especially with regard to the evaluation statutes, it leads, some, it leads to some uh, areas of interpretation in valuing property. So I, I think that's why, you know, uh, we, we made the statement or reached the conclusion that, you know, by no means did the assessor do everything perfectly here. And quite frankly, I think if I reviewed the work of any other assessor in Connecticut, I'd probably find the same thing, that there are some uh, better practices that they could administer. And I would say that with some of the assessors I work with, who I think are phenomenal. Um, but, but no one's perfect, and it's, 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 it's a difficult job. So, I mean, I guess what I'm really good at is getting at is the portions of the work that weren't done perfectly or, you know, as characterized here, um, the parts uh, where the law wasn't followed. Would you say that's exposed us to any legal, potential legal liability? That's a concern I have. No, other than the fact that um, uh, any taxpayer could file a, an appeal um, to the Board of Assess to the Board of Assessment Appeals, followed by an appeal to the Connecticut Gen to the uh, Connecticut Superior Court within you know 60 days of the issuance of the BA decision pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 12-117A and, and any taxpayer could um, appeal his or her taxes sorry his or her assessment um, within one year of the issuance of the uh, of the assessment um, uh, directly to the Connecticut Superior Court by, uh, bypassing a, a, an appeal to the Board of Assessment Appeals pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 12119. Um, there's a lot of appeals that have merit, quite frankly. There's lots of tax appeals that get filed that do not have merit and get processed through the system. It's a system we have. Okay. So I don't think be beyond your regular appeal of an assessment pursuant to 12117A or 12119, I don't think the town has any liability beyond what every other town has for potential appeals of, of, an ass of assessments on its grand list based on what the assessor did in Enfield. Okay. Uh, you, you referenced the Bright Line rule earlier that was used in regard to uh, farm exemption property uh, that ha also has some woodland uh, components to it. Um, you characterize that as contrary to PA 490, essentially you know, not really based on anything. Uh, is that correct? I, I don't know if I said it was contrary to PA 490. Um, with regard to the, the bright line rule uh, pertaining to, to woodland, um, the assessor, uh, his practice was um, w with regard to um, reviewing properties that uh, 
farm properties that if if there was a, a woodland component and the, and it was uh, and the woodland was uh, located in a parcel outside of the the subject parcel um, that he didn't consider that um, part of the farm and you know we go through a pretty detailed analysis of whether that's right or wrong and determine as a matter of best practice each property uh, that is applying for a farm exemption should be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis and there's there would be some instances in which uh, a, a, a property may have woodland that functions as part of the farm unit that just happens to be on a parcel that neighbors that, that that's adjacent to the the subject farm parcel okay so I would say it's more an issue of uh, best practice okay so what would you say the best practice is in regard to that kind of property to review the uh, requested exemption on a case-by-case -case basis so you would you'd not recommend you, you think the bright line rule is not a best practice yes okay um, okay, Nick, excuse me. You can, uh, I think there's probably other people that will want a couple of questions, but we'll, we can come back. That's uh, perfectly so fine. That's, can, that's why I waited to, waited to see if anybody had yeah. any other questions. But if yeah. other folks, I, I'm I, happy I, to pause. Okay, if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I'm not an attorney, um, and I did read this twice, and I, I went through and did a lot of highlighting. I'm talking for the average citizen, average resident in Enfield that's going to pick this up and read through it, and I think they're going to have the same takeaway as I did, which is what I thought right from the very beginning, that we had a new employee that was doing things differently, and we had a very competent BAA that questioned it. I think this report is fair. I don't have any questions with that, but I am hoping that our takeaway from this as a town is that we never let anything like this get this contentious again so that we have to use taxpayers' dollars to bring in outside counsel. I agree. That is my hope, that all these boxes and all these big binders and all of this can be taken care of internally by supervisors over these people. Because to me, yes, we, were, we had no other choice than to use taxpayers' dollars to find this out. We had no other choice. But as a taxpayer in my town, and speaking for taxpayers in this town, I hope we learned a lesson that sometimes we have to sit around a table and we have to communicate and we have to get to the bottom of it. So moving forward, again, I thank you. I do think this was an honest report, but there's nothing in it that really surprises me. Because your takeaways are, you did right, you did right, you did wrong, you did wrong. Scale of justice. Yes. So I thank you for your time. I apologize to the taxpayers that we had to spend so much money on this, but now we actually have some facts. Thank you. Councilor Ludwig. For me, uh, for me, pages 50 to 58 or 56 really is what, you know, for me, why I was wanted to do an independent review. I think it's some really interesting information here. You know, again, Supreme Court commenting on, you know, again, when it comes to 490 Woodland, yeah, again, conservation, it's not, it's not just about, you know, food. It's also about conservation of land. And so when it comes to subjectivity within the law, when does a best practice, especially around reclassification, you know, get to a point when maybe they're using too much, they're going beyond the subjectivity the law allows? Is there a determination for that? Or is that, again, su subject to the basic the issue case by case basis? For me, this is for why I wanted the report, is some of the reclassification of land, which went on, which I thought, quite frankly, not even being, being a layperson, didn't sound right to me. And I think these pages, you know, I think are really important for people to read, because it sort of gets to that, beyond the 490 issue where someone didn't fill out a form, 
You know what I mean? I think so. The when does someone not doing a best practice be? It's you know we have the we're overstepping the subjectivity the law allows that individual. It's a good question. Um, I think with regard to uh, the reclassification of soils, um, the best practice. First of all, farmers know their land. Yeah, I agree. And I think it yeah. was uh, Ms. Longy who, who said it in one of her, in her interview that if a farmer thought he or she could farm for tobacco, then they'd be probably farming for tobacco. Right. And um, I think that farmers generally know their land and, and, and certainly know it better than the assessor. Um, and so if the farmer believes there's a wetland somewhere, more than likely there is. Right. Um, and uh, with regard to you know, whether the soil could, um, could uh, support a higher and better use, um, the farmer would presumably know that. Um, and uh, However, even if the assessor is right that there could be a higher, better use, and I, and I, we, we, we provide an example, uh, I think around page 54, about yep. you know if if you're farming for corn, which I think is tillable C, correct me if I'm wrong, and you uh, uh, tobacco, a, a, yeah, yeah, and and yeah, the assessor want, says, well, I think you could do tobacco, yeah, um, should leave it where it is, Agreed. as probably as probably a best practice. Um, now, now, having said that, just to give everybody a little context too. Um, and for somebody who lives in the tax in the tax appeal world almost every day, uh, and this is forget Enfield, forget the town of Enfield. This is the state of Connecticut. I mostly practice down in, in <coughs> County, at least with my tax appeal work. Um, and so, you know, you'd be surprised what people do in tax appeals. And I'm talking about major publicly traded companies, and you know, significant people within those companies that. You know, try to. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say this carefully. Um, are, are, are careful as to what information gets provided in the case. You have to fight tooth and nail on discovery things that you're damn well entitled to. Um, there's games that get played with you know on properties with big numbers. Uh, um, cases recently we had uh, 300, 400 million dollar cases, uh, value properties, uh, significant cases. Um, I'm not talking about a residential property owner. I'm talking about publicly traded REITs um, that play games, quite frankly. So I think assessors, just to give you some context, are always, in general, and, and some assessors more than others, apprehensive to believe anything that a property owner says because they've had so many instances over the years where a property owner or a rep tax representative for some property owner was hiding something or not telling the truth or, you know, uh, it, it, that's just the it's just the process we, we live in so I just think you know for whatever it's worth it's just something to think about as you know as to why an assessor may be apprehensive to, uh, to accept uh, what someone says sometimes so within the subjectivity of the law this is right does the town under state law have the right to restrict some of that subjectivity and so for me again I've said this a number the tie to your point I'll use a basement I'm not a baseball fan I'm a football fan Ties should go to the taxpayer, to what you just described. And so when does that, if that happens, so if the best practice is you shouldn't reclassify the land, then it happens again because you, now it's no longer, you sort of, it's beyond best practice, right? Uh, generally, the assessor has authority to make determinations with regard to the assessment of property. Right. And to the extent that somebody doesn't agree with it, they could appeal to the Board of Assessment Appeals. That right is set forth in Connecticut General Statute 12-111. Um, they could appeal then the decision of the Board of Assessment Appeals, as we said, pursuant to 12117A to the, gen yeah. to the uh, Superior <coughs> Court, or file a direct appeal uh, of an assessment pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 12119. So to the extent that a property owner doesn't agree with the decision of an assessor, they could file an appeal. Now, having said that, um, for those of us who, who, who represent municipalities and those of you who, who serve as who serve your constituents, um, Filing a, tax, filing a lawsuit is not cheap, and, 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 and to the extent that for, for certain property owners you, that could be avoided, you want to always try to help yeah. them. So and, I, could and I appreciate it. Last question. I think for me it's the term evaluation versus reclassification, which I think is a big legal difference for me. Not a lawyer. I get revaluation is certainly evaluation subjective. I agree with that 100%. I get a little 
nervous about reclassification. So I was just saying, for me, uh, I, like this, that part of the report justified why I needed an independent review. So thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Councilor Despert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to say I agree with uh, the majority of my uh, colleagues here. I think this is a fair report. Um, and I wanted to say I think you'd be happy to know the PA open space 490 is on our uh, agenda to move forward tonight. I think that would clear up some of this. And um, good job on the 20K saved. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, the Bright Line Rule uh, quote that I was thinking of is the, the Bright Line Rule is contrary, sorry, this Bright Line Rule is contrary to the intent of PA 490. It should not have been applied. That was the one I was thinking about. Is that a fair statement? I'm sorry. Could, uh, oh, sorry, page 50. Page 50 um, looks like two sentences into the second paragraph. Okay, yeah, I read that. Okay. Um, so you, you also noted that the legal rule uh, is that the current usage, and this is in a separate section, the legal rule is that a current usage of PA 490 property is used rather than the valuation of its market usage. Is that a fair way to characterize the legal rule for that? I don't understand. Uh, you, okay. Did you uh, want to tell page, me what yeah, page, page 51. Um, second sentence of the second paragraph. Therefore, comma when, is that what you're referring to? Yes. I mean, that's not, yeah, what you're referring to is a, is a, is a quote from a, from a Supreme Court case, uh, Ristiti versus the town of, of Stonington. So um, you just want to make sure I understand. So that's, you're using that to talk about what uh, the current standard is. So rather than market value uh, for farmland, it's current usage, evaluating whether an exemption should stand. Well, the, the, the it's really to, to, I guess, to provide some background as to what the law is on, on, on exempt properties such as farmland, and and the in, the intent is not to to determine to, to assess it based on fair market value, but rather to be, to value it based on its current use, which if it's a farm, is going to be uh, uh, a use for the owner that is not going to uh, be as profitable as other uses, and the idea is to in order to preserve farm farming and farmland in Connecticut. That we provide an exemption for the for for active farms uh, to be able to allow those property owners to continue to farm the property and not feel uh, because of the taxes they have to sell the property for some other use such as apartments or strip plaza. Okay, got you. I want to make sure I understood that. So, of the fourteen. Um uh, 490 exemption properties that you did review, did you look at the extent at which uh, market uh, value was used as a standard to determine an exemption versus the proper standard fair use? The 14 properties I think you're referring to is uh, with regard to the appeals that were filed at the Board of Assessment Appeals for applications where the property owner, um, whether it be farmland or forest land, didn't file an application. There's no application on file. And so, I mean, it's a strict, it, the, the, uh, the statute is clear. You, you have to file an application. And if there was no application filed, then you can't get the exemption. And having said that, for those property owners who may have lost that year, uh, they had the opportunity the, the following year to, to file an application for exemption, either for forest land or farmland. So was there a subset of the 490 exemption properties that you reviewed uh, in general or uh, in particular with the standard in mind, given that you touch on it? In general, we reviewed uh, 
the 490 exemption applications that uh, were at issue in the 21 revaluation. Um, uh, we didn't review them extensively, e each case extensively, each application extensively. Um, with regard to the, the ones we refer, that I referred to, the 14 that went to the Board of Assessment Appeals, uh, those were um, matter, uh, uh, appeals in which uh, the, the issue was that the, the owner didn't, proper, didn't uh, properly file a, an application as required by statute to get the exemption. Okay. Whether, to, to what extent it should have been valued uh, under PA 490 is irrelevant because they didn't have if they didn't file the proper application then they weren't entitled to any to a, a lower valuation under PA 490. Yeah, and I understand that there are two different subsections. I just want to understand whether you applied that. So thank you for for that. Um, in regard to the soil evaluation that you talk about in the report, um, the ex as I understand it, based on what you said, the accepted practice for soil evaluation relative to taxable value uh, is to work with an expert. To evaluate soil composition, is that right? That I think is the best practice. I, I can't say whether throughout the state other assessors do that, but um, if if the assessor is going to make a determination as to uh, the classification of soil, then he should rely on some some expert uh, to provide uh, that opinion. Okay, um, and just to understand the distinction, so when you say best practice, uh, is is that based off of? it's used across the state or just that uh, an individual you spoke to who does this work thinks that it's the best practice? Part of it is a common sense approach that, um, and, 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 and also uh, based on our analysis um, of the limited legal authority with regard to dealing with this issue as far as the classification of, of soil. Um, and furthermore, uh, there was an interview done with Joe Nichols who was the uh, a representative from the Farm Bureau, and uh, and actually that was one of the few interviews that I did not conduct just because of scheduling, and uh, my colleague uh, Attorney Studer did, so maybe he could just briefly uh, respond as well since he uh, specifically interviewed Miss um, Nichols. Yeah, with respect to the productivity of soils, she reiterated what's been said that typically the farmer knows their land the best; they know what their land is capable of growing, and a farmer's typically not going to grow a crop that is less profitable than, than say, something that could be grown in, in total A soil. Um, she did note that the um, original intent of the statute was to assess the land based on the productivity of the soil, what it was capable of producing. That's how you get that range of tillable A through tillable uh, D or but then both beyond that. And then the beyond that, the wetlands, uh, ledge, wasteland, et cetera. Speak loud. Um, so typically, I think the best practice is to, generally speaking, listen to what the farmer's telling you. If you have a reason to dispute what the farmer is reporting and an independent assessment of the soil needs to be made, that assessment needs to come from someone other than the assessor, unless the assessor in that case is also a qualified soil scientist, which in this case, uh, Mr. Helms is not. And he admitted he was not. He did not hold himself out to be a soil scientist. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so w with that concern in mind, uh, it sounds like there were some instances where uh, soil was characterized by the assessor um, uh, you know, as more productive than it had been under the prior assessment and discussion by the farmer. Is that fair to say? I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure that characterization is correct. Um, I can recall one instance that we discussed with Mr. Helms, and I don't recall the property again. There were a number of, uh, of appeals that we looked at. But I believe land was being cleared for farmland. It had previously been wooded. Um, and the farmer indicated that it was tillable C, for example, and I, again, these may not be the right classifications. The assessor looked at the lots to the left and to the right of the property and saw that they were producing, for example, tobacco. He then based his assessment of that previously wooded lot and said, well, based on what's around you, you're capable of, your soil is more productive than you're saying it is. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, and was there also an example where um, this was done in regard to wetlands 
So uh, previously, the assessment had been uh, for this farm property that it was a wetlands categorized property. Uh, that changed based on uh, what should have perhaps been a determination by a soil scientist. Is that accurate? Uh, Mr. Helms did indicate that he would look at the official town wetlands map to determine if there were wetlands on the site. And as we know, the wetlands map is, is a tremendous resource. It is a useful resource. It is an inexact resource. Um, if the assessor is going to be removing wetland designations and farm units, uh, you, you probably want to rely on something a, a bit more concrete than the official town wetlands map since the town regulations direct um, individual determinations to be made on a case-by-case -case basis based on a field review. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, uh, in regard to a concern that had been brought up, um, there was a note that recording taxpayers during BA appeals um, you know, might have a chilling effect on individuals presenting their appeal. And just thinking about best practices, could you talk a little bit about that? Um, so, some towns record BA hearings, and others don't. Um, they're public meetings. Um, any member of the public could attend. I've had, for example, in Norwalk, which is a bigger community, and there's a couple, there was, when newspapers had bigger budgets and there was a, uh, more beat reporters, uh, maybe they, you know, one would attend uh, the Board of Assessment Appeals hearings. Um, looking for something to report. So anybody could go to a Board of Assessment Appeals meeting, they're open to the public, and anybody could record, including in, in those instances, uh, uh, a member of the local news publication. Um, but based on the acrimonious relationship that you know has evolved with the, the Board of Assessment Appeals and the assessor, uh, our recommendation is um, to not record the meetings unless the Board of Assessment Appeals would, thinks it would be helpful for, their, for purposes of like their deliberations. Um, to be able to go back to a recording, and just to give you uh, an ex just to give you an example on the issue of recording. So, I, I don't know what Enfield does whether the full board, the full uh, BA meets on every application. But you have a lot of communities, especially those that are bigger, where uh, when somebody comes in with a BA uh, appeal, um, they'll meet with an individual BA member, and it may be helpful to the BA to record that so that. What happens is you know, one BA member will, will hear the appeal, and then like five days later, they'll deliberate. And the BA member will take out his or her notes and say, well, I talked to so you know, the, 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 the appellant, and here's what we discussed. And so for some BAs, it's helpful to have a tape so that if there's a question about what was discussed at the meeting, the BA member could go back and listen to it. Um, be, it or it could be helpful to the other two BA members who are voting on it who are not in the hearing. And that, that happens in a, a lot of a lot of the state where the full BA doesn't meet on each application. So it's it's really on a town by town basis uh, whether the BA wants to record and, and and our opinion is based on everything that's going on in here in Enfield if the BA doesn't need the recordings then the assessor's office shouldn't bother recording. Okay, that that's helpful. Um, you know, on the same vein I I I've heard the concern that um, you know, recording an appeal, the assessor recording an appeal during the person's presentation um, gave some folks the impression that they might be retaliated against. There's a particular gentleman that uh, appealed, his appeal was overturned, that his original assessment was increased uh, from the prior value. Did you look into instances of that, of those concerns? Yes. I mean, we reviewed the issue of, of the recordings, and the assessor has every right to go to a meeting and record, but based on everything that was going on in Enfield, uh, he probably could have used better judgment, and if he knew it was gonna bother the BAA, you know, even though he, it was, he was well within his right to do so, quite frankly, as anybody else in this room, if they wanted to record a BAA meeting could, just not a good idea, and, and, and quite frankly, it's probably just unnecessary. Um, so that was our conclusion there with regard to recordings. Okay, um, so for an instance like that, I think that might have hopefully was reviewed um, by the investigation. In an instance where an appeal is overturned and then that original value is increased, um, is that permissible without some kind of property improvement during that period? I think it's incorrect to categorize um, uh, a matter like that as a, an instance where, the, where uh, a value, the, the decision of the BA was overturned. Again. 
if the BA made a decision on the 21 grand list and then the, B, the assessor uh, made a, a determination on the 22 grand list that was different than the BA's prior decision on the 21 grand list, that's not overturning the BAA. Um, it's just making, having a, 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 a valuation of the property and corresponding assessment on the next grand list year that happens to be different than the BA's prior decision, which is permitted by law. Um, again, the assessor has to certify the grand list. And so uh, if he feels that there was a decision made by the BAA that um, under law can't stand, then he has the right under 1255 in his watchtower role to, to make a change. Having said that, the assessor shouldn't make changes based on not agreeing with the decision of the BAA based on you know, their uh, uh, review of an appraisal, for example. But where the BAA may have made a decision that he believes uh, can't be uh, substantiated by uh, by a appraisal by let's say the Connecticut general the, the Connecticut law um, zeroing out an assessment where there's no justification under Connecticut law to um, provide a zero value and it, essentially a de facto exemption, then it would make sense that the assessor in the next grand list would. Um, would have a, a, a valuation and assessment of the property that's not zero. Okay, so uh, I think your recommendation in that regard was uh, if a, if a uh, property owner feels that the condition of his property has changed without justification, uh, it's imperative that the property owner raise their concern with the assessor. Is, was that your recommendation? Yes. Okay, um, do you have any suggestions for how to do that going forward? I mean, creating an environment uh, where that's possible, because I, I believe, at least I was told uh, by some constituents that they did uh, try attempt to speak with the assessor, the assessor's office didn't go particularly far. Do you have any suggestions with that? I think you had a perfect storm in Enfield with your 21 revaluation. You had a new assessor come in um, who had different practices that he administered during a revaluation year. Um, for example, reviewing exemption applications every time there's a revaluation, which is a good practice. And most and other assessors should more assessors should do that throughout the state. Um, but I think you had a perfect storm where a new assessor coming in, getting situated in the town, and probably not having and in the middle of a re, and, and coming in in the middle of a revaluation, which is sort of atypical. It doesn't happen a lot. It happens from time to time. But um, I think uh, you had sort of a perfect storm where the assessor didn't have a lot of, didn't have as much time as he would want to work with constituents. I believe he acknowledged that in his interview and acknowledged that um, he could do a better job of making himself available to the public, but also explained that he just didn't have the time during the 21 revaluation that he otherwise would have and that he will have in going forward. So I think that taxpayers should have every opportunity to, to meet with the uh, assessor uh, to review any concerns they have about evaluation of their property. Okay, uh, last question here uh, is about the, the watchtower rule that you referenced earlier under under 12-55B. Um, I, I just want to make sure I understand that. Uh, to me, it seems an exemption is distinct from an assessment. And, and the reason why I come to that conclusion is uh, a fairly recent Connecticut Supreme Court case called Wilton Campus versus Wilton defines the word assessment as uh, the word assessment means the official valuation of a taxpayer's property for the purpose of taxation. Um, I, I just want to understand where the thought is that an exemption, uh, whether that's uh, having the exemption or not having the exemption, is an assessment rather than a separate statutory device because it doesn't seem to fall within that Wilton uh, definition. So please help me understand that. So with the Wilton campus case, my rec and by the way, I, I represent the town of Wilton, uh, okay. my office is town attorney. Um, uh, we were not town attorney when the Wilton campus uh, case started. And uh, at the time, Cohen and Wolf was counsel and um, they were handling the appeal that uh, I believe ultimately went up to the Supreme Court. And I just recommended that they could, even when we came in, uh, that we not take over the case, let them finish their, their work in the case. Um, so we didn't lose the case, uh, but but I was the uh, but but I was representing the town and reviewing the case for the town as it as it, there, as it was uh, percolating up to and through the Supreme Court. And my recollection there was that you had uh, a prior assessor who um, assessed a uh, um, a, a penalty um, on a property. It was my recollection of the Wilton Campus case. 
um, and he did it after he signed the grand list. So um, the assessor's practice was, you know, he would sign the grand list, and then thereafter he would issue notices for um, uh, for any changes in assessment during the reval process, which is actually the correct thing to do with regard to like new construction under the statute from the date that you sign the grand list you have 10 days the assessor has 10 days to um to issue any notices um to taxpayers for uh an interim revaluate interim valuation where there was maybe new construction done during a non-revaluation year and there's a change in the value of the property um and so those notices have to get issued from the date that after the uh, it's a 10 day period from the date you sign a grand list to 10 days thereafter and if you don't do that then that increase in value would roll forward to the following grand list and he did in that prior assessor in Wilton did that for a an income and expense penalty um, and uh, the interpretation of the statute was that uh, any such uh, levy uh, of that penalty had to have been done on the as of the date that the grand list was signed because the penalty was assessed as of that grand list so for example if it was uh you didn't fill out your income and expense form in june of 2022 then when the assessor signed the uh october 1 2022 grand list on january 31 22 it had to include all assessments including any penalties derived from the 22 grand list which would have included um, the levy of a penalty for not filing your income and expense statement as of June 1. That's what the Wilton case is about. And it's about, if you're signing the grand list, it's got to include everything from that grand list. Gotcha. But I just, so they offer definition, you know, of, of assessment under uh, the Watchtower Rule 12-55B. The Supreme Court talks about that. I just my concern is, I guess, I wouldn't want us to proceed on a uh, legal theory rather than something that's well settled, uh, because that could potentially, if this came up again, uh, cause us some liability if we were to say, well, uh, we actually can uh, overturn these on the basis that it's a watchtower uh, rule function. Uh, but I don't view this as a valuation. I think it's a separate statutory thing. So I just, if that's settled, let me know. If what's settled? Uh, whether uh, an ex dealing with an exemption, removing it, implementing it, is falls under the watchtower function of 12-55B. Uh, I, I, again, uh, um, it, with regard to what the assessor did here, he didn't um, overturn the, the BA decisions. Again, in the next grand list, for certain cases, uh, for certain properties, he uh, had a different valuation than their prior decision on the prior grand list um, and, and did so in his watchtower role. Um, and again, the, the difference is here, it's not that he didn't agree with their decision because he didn't agree with the manner in which they may have uh, um, taken into consideration the, appellant, the appellant's uh, uh, appraisal, but rather that there was a decision made by the BA that resulted in an assessment that um, that he couldn't sign off on when he signed the grand list um, because it couldn't be substantiated under Connecticut law. And therefore, um, he, he had a different value in the following grand list year. Okay. That, that's the, the watchtower role is very limited. Proper uh, assessors should be very uh, careful uh, of, of making uh, uh, or, or having assessments in non revaluation years that are different than the prior year. Um, uh, mm -hmm unless there's a specific reason for it, such as uh, there was new construction done and therefore you're allowed to increase the value pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 12-53A, maybe? I believe. What? I think so. Yeah, so um, it's, it's a very limited role. Okay, that, that helps me understand your, your argument. Uh, thank you and thank you for your time. You're welcome. Okay, th th thank you very much, uh, Attorney Coppola and Attorney Stutter. Uh, Councilor Nelson? A couple quick questions. I'm a little more simple in my questions than Councilman Hopkins. Um, revals every five years, correct? Uh, you do a major one every 10 and... Yeah, generally it's every five years. Uh, if, if, a, if a community got a, an extension one year, 
um, so that they essentially had a six-year revaluation, and the following revaluation would be a four-year cycle, not a five-year. Okay. Not to get overly technical. One-year Bridgeport got a six-year cycle, but it's Bridgeport. So. so how is it possible somebody gets their assessment and reval, goes to the BAA, gets, gets it changed, the following year the assessor revalues their property again and values it for a lot more than he valued it the first time before the BAA overturned it, adding stuff like a heated in-ground pool because the pool was never heated, it's still not heated, but now all of a sudden it's heated. And um, there were a few other changes made and this particular person had come and he talked to the council about how he was treated and stuff like that. But his gets appeal or his gets overturned again. Yes, I understand they're not changing what the BAA did in 2021. So is this taxpayer have to go through this every single year? That's absurd. So uh, again, I don't I don't know the specifics of that case. Uh, if if there was any work done at the property and a building permit pulled at any time, no. then the assessor would have the ability to, to value the new construction. Um, but that's not what you just, you said earlier that he has the right to revalue what he feels the next year. He's not overturning the BAA for 2021, he's revaluing the property in 2022. If there's no permit pulled, then he's, he has the right to go do this to everybody every single year and everybody's going to have to appeal every year i thought that was the point of every five years the assessor should not be changing uh, assessments in the manner in which you've described again mm -hmm. i don't have anything in front of me i don't i don't know the case so it's hard for me to op I, I, I'm, un I'm uncomfortable uh uh opining as to uh a case in which i haven't seen anything but but Sometimes the devil's in the details. But having said that, um, the, the, the assessor's role, uh, watch our role uh, pursuant to 12-55, um, I think subsection B, is very limited. And so um, where, again, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, property owner comes in, uh, property value is a million dollars. The town's va uh, fair market value as of the, as of the grand list year is... Uh, is a million dollars. They come in with an appraisal for, you know, five hundred thousand. BAA grants the appeal five hundred thousand. And let's say the the appraisal is not very good, and um, the, B, the the assessor looks at it the next year. Says, I, I just don't agree with this. Doesn't matter. That's a decision the BAA made. The assessor shouldn't make a cha shouldn't change that value the following grand list year if it's um, not a revaluation year and there's been no new construction done, et cetera. So if, th if that's your concern, then yes, the assessor absolutely shouldn't make a change there. However, if somebody, uh, we, we, we outlined, we, we provided a couple examples of some applications where I think it was one that was a tax stabilization agreement where the Board of Assessment Appeals reduced it to zero. The assessor in, 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 in um, taking his oath and, and, and actually signing the grand list and, and certifying it to the Office of Policy and Management um, it, under, 12, one, uh, under 1255, determined that it wasn't zero and there was no legal basis to substantiate it a zero Connecticut general statutes wouldn't yep. there's no there's no way under Connecticut general statutes to substantiate a zero value on the property and and put it back to the, the number that he felt right. it should be um so that's that's the difference and 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 I think the concern you raised is one in which it, it that should never happen well and, and that's where I, I read what the one you just referred to in the book you had said that you reviewed 14 cases. Are all 14 cases in this report? I think the 14 applications we're referring, that I made reference to were those um, applications where uh, the property owner didn't file a uh, required application mm -hmm. uh, to obtain an exemption for farmland or forest land. Mm -hmm. And it was as simple as there was no application filed and the statute requires it. Mm -hmm. That's what I was referring to. In general, we didn't go through on a case-by-case -case basis except for those cases which uh, illustrated a, uh, an area of concern that we were asked to address. Right. And um, I, I'm not an assessor. I don't know how it works. Um, so when the assessor goes into the street card, 
last year it's not a heated pool. This year it's a heated pool. Does he have to change something on that street card? Does somebody physically have to change something on that street card to make it a value that they're going to be charged? Presumably, yes. Yeah, somebody okay. would have to make okay. some sort so, of a change. Now, so, having said that, if there's a a, a, fa a difference in a property, um, you know, the assessor walks by and realizes that, um, you know, uh, something is there which he didn't value because he didn't realize. Well, it's it not was there. there. It's then, not there. There is no heated pool. But this is this is the situation. Is you know, this particular taxpayer feels that they're being targeted because they did come and speak up, and you know. Here, he's supposed to be protected for five years. He went to the BAA. The BAA ruled in his favor, um, in my opinion, rightfully so. And then the next year, he gets revalued by the town assessor at a substantially higher value than the year before. And now things have changed on his street card, like he went from not having a heated pool. Now he has a heated pool to try to justify all those increases. Well, he doesn't have, nothing changed. So how did they go and make those changes against this particular taxpayer? And he has a right to know. And I think this council has a right to know. The only thing I have an issue with with your report is I believe several times you said you referred to a couple minor things that the assessor did. And then there were other things, too. And you didn't get into the other things. But it seems like with the BAA, you got a little more detailed on the other things that they did. So the other things, and I think Councilman Hopkins was referring to it, I would like a little more detail on what those other things were that the assessor might have overstepped his bounds a little bit on. Because without knowing that, how do we really make a fair, a fair assessment on what's being done or what's not being done? We attempted in, in reviewing everything to determine, um, in general, you know, from a practice standpoint, was what was the assessor's practice? Was it correct? Mm -hmm. uh, was it legal? And in some instances, you know, was it a best practice or not? Um, to the extent that if we saw an app, uh, uh, a matter where clearly we thought the assessor made a, a mistake, we, we, we generally I think would would cite that in the report. Um, as far as the application you're referring to, I'm more than happy to take a look at it. Um, there may have been uh, a valid reason why the assessment changed from one year to another, and maybe maybe there's not. Maybe as you've alluded, to, maybe as you've suggested, maybe the assessor um, did something that was improper. Without seeing, without going through it, I don't know. I'd have to review it and talk to the assessor, find out what he did and why. And I'd be more than happy to to opine back to the council right. on that app, on that property. Okay. Um, so uh, again, you know, I think it's like a lot of these cases. It's, it's a fact, but it's a case by case kind of analysis. Understood. And, yep. and so I'm more than happy to, to take a look at it. So you'd still be willing to review particular cases? What's that, Gina? <clears throat> All right. Thank you. You're welcome, Councilor Desperd. And then you. I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I share. Uh, Councillor Nelson's concern. I just also, you know, I think that um, if we really start getting into the weeds, that's going to cost us a lot of money. So I, I, um, I, I think we probably could, you probably could go with a, a fine tooth comb over every single case. That's just going to take, I mean, that would take, I imagine, a very long time. So, I mean, I, I share your concern and I do think that, that, you know, that should be looked into, but I, I think we, we could be opening the door for uh, a lot more work for you, but I don't think we want to we, we want that, uh, so just wanted to say that and, and ask you. I mean, I, it sounds like you know you probably could have dug much further in. I'll review that one free of charge. If you get me the <laughs> if you get me the documentation, I won't charge for my time associated with it, and I'll review it. I'm not going to give you a long report on it, but I could review it and report back to the town attorney or whomever, mm -hmm. and I'm more than happy to do that for you and not charge for any of my time to do it. Um, I, I think you know if there if there is an example of a you know. Uh, a case where there's a there's a problem which the the assessor uh, uh, did his work. Then I'm, I'm more than happy to take a look at it and and and, and provide that feedback. Beautiful. Thank you. 
Well, <clears throat> thank you very, very much. Uh, a lot of the questions that were presented here were some of the questions that I even had. You know, you know, I just have one thing maybe that you can uh, just explain a little about the uh, effective year bill, uh, suppression of field cards. I know that was brought up in the, in the report. Um, uh, I know that there were accusations that were made by alter, altering uh, field cards. I don't know if you could explain could that a little. Yeah. Thanks. It's a little confusing. So the effective year bill is an after the fact termination that's made by the uh, uh, revaluation company. Um, uh, it's actually not even a determination made by the revaluation company. It's uh, basically uh, effective year bill is uh, a calculation based on the actual um, year, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, actual uh, year of construction and then the grade of the property and that results in an effective year bill. So um, what actually impacts your value is your actual year and your grade, your grade really more than anything else. Um, and then effect, so then your, pro your house gets valued. The effective year built is like an after the fact calculation if you took the actual year of construction of your home and the, and, and, and the condition. Just to give you an example, my house was built in 1910, I think it was one of the oldest, uh, it's one of the oldest town, uh, uh, homes in the, in the town of Orange. It's been redone over the years. So the actual year of construction is 1910. Uh, it's probably got a pretty high grade. Uh, and so it, it, the effective year built may be, I don't know, 1998. I don't know, and quite frankly, I don't care because it doesn't matter to me. It's an after the fact, um, uh, um, I would say designation. Uh, uh, just for really a point of reference. And so the two assessors that we interviewed um, in Fairfield County, both of them uh, do not have the effective year built on their field cards. I remember that in the interview with Denise Hames, who's the assessor in West, and I think she's uh, been the assessor in five other communities. Does that sound right? And she said she's never had the effective year built on any of her field cards because it confuses the public. And, and, and Paul Frio is the assessor in Westport, said the same thing, and he's been the assessor in other communities as well over the last 30 years. So um, some assessors have it on the field cards and others don't. Um, and uh, it's, it's really up to the discretion of the assessor whether they want to have it on the field card or not. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank, thank you. Uh, any other final questions? Um, I want to thank you very much for all of your answers, for your time, for the report, everything that, that you have done. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. Uh, Councilor Despard and second by Councilor Ungeyer. Uh All in favor? Unanimous. Uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. All right, good evening. Um, welcome to the Water Pollution Control Authority special meeting. Today is Monday, June 5th. The time is 7.30. Uh, this meeting can also be viewed on YouTube. Uh, uh, roll call, please, uh, Sheila. Vice Chair Sakala. Here. Chairman Crisati. Here. Commissioner Despard. Here. Commissioner Finger. Here. Commissioner Hopkins. Here. Commissioner Ludwig. Here. Commissioner Mangini. Here. Commissioner Nelson. Here. Commissioner Pisner. Here. Commissioner Santanella. Here. And Commissioner Ungeyer. Here. 11 members present, none are absent. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a resolution setting a public hearing for the 2023-2024 sewer service fees and rates. <clears throat> the resolution reads, whereas the Enfield Water Pollution Control Authority values the opinions and comments of its constituents, and whereas in accordance with Section 86-52F, the Enfield Water Pollution Control Authority must hold a public hearing on the proposed sewer service fees and rates for the upcoming fiscal year. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Enfield Water Pollution Control 
authority shall conduct a public hearing in the town council chambers at town hall 820 enfield street monday june 19 2023 at 6 45 p.m on the proposed sewer service fees and rates for the fiscal year 2023-2024 date prepared june 2nd 2023 date prepared by the town manager's office so moved second councillor mangini and the second by councillor Nelson, is there any discussion on this? Councillor Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'm comfortable with moving forward with a public hearing as long as um, some additional information is provided, and I know we can't really do that uh, conditionally, but I expect more information to come, uh, which is good, the purpose of which being uh, figuring out a rate system which uh, fairly um, charges people who use under 20,000 gallons uh, and you know, makes folks who, who use more than 20,000 gallons uh, pay a little bit more comparatively. I think that's a fair way to do it because uh, most people in town use the lesser amount. Businesses use sometimes use more. I think it's better for the businesses to uh, pay comparatively more. So I look forward to getting that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will be getting that information. As soon as we get it, we will disseminate. Councilor Ludwig. Quick through the mayor to the town manager. Where will this be posted? Or taxpayers and know for the public before the public hearing. Where would this be posted on our website? Thank you. You're welcome. Typically, it's posted under the town manager's page with all the presentations, and we also do it on the main page with the alerts. Thank you. Okay, okay great. And, and once we have all the information, we will post it for everybody. Um, roll call, Sheila. Vice Chair Sakala. Four. Chairman Crisati? Four. Commissioner Despard? Four. Commissioner Finger? Four. Commissioner Hopkins? Four. Commissioner Ludwig? Four. Commissioner Mangini? Four. Commissioner Nelson? Four. Commissioner Pisner? Four. Commissioner Santanella? Four. Commissioner Ungeyer? Four. Eleven in favor, none against. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So yes, moved. Councillor Finger and a second, second by Councillor Nelson. Uh, all in favor by raise of hands is unanimous. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <clears throat> Everyone, before we begin our regular meeting, we do have one public hearing that we must take care of first. Uh, the public hearing is amending the Enfield Town Code Section 82-41 parking violation fines. <clears throat> Sheila, roll call, please. Uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala. Here. Mayor Crisotti. Here. Uh, Councilor Despard. Here. Councilor Finger. Here. Councilor Hopkins. Here. Councilor Ludwig. Here. Councilor Mangini. Here. Councilor Nelson. Here. Councilor Pisner. Here. Councilor Santanella. Here. And Councilor Ungeyer. Here. Eleven members are present, none are absent. The following notice of public hearing was published in the Hartford Current on Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023. Town of Enfield legal notice. The Enfield Town Council will hold a public hearing in the Enfield Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, on Monday, June 5th, 2023. Uh, that's at 735 to allow interested residents an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the amendment to the Enfield Town Code Section 82-41 parking violation fines. Dated this 18th day of May 2023, Sheila M. Bailey, Town Clerks. The announcing of the ground rules for the public hearing once again, there's no time limit, but I ask each person, person not to take up too much time so that everyone will have an opportunity to speak. After each person who desires had a chance to speak, I'll permit those individuals who desire a second chance. If they need to come up, I will uh, allow that. Please refrain from personalities. Is there anybody that would like to approach the council? Good evening. Um, before I begin, uh, may I uh, ask a, a quick uh, point of parliamentary inquiry? So I 
Could you I, please state your name and address for the record, please? Y yes, but I, I don't want this question to be part of the uh, public statement. I do have a few people with me, and so this would apply for all of us. Uh, my name is Bobby Burial, B-E-R-R-I-A-U-L-T, and I live at Four Highland Place Park, Enfield, Connecticut. And the question I have is, I only saw the resolution in the agenda park, uh, packet. I didn't see the actual language. So would uh, this um, public hearing pertain to um, what is happening with regards to the parking situation on the streets around Jimmy's Pub? Uh, the $10 um, uh, fee if you park on like the surround streets if you don't have a residence permit? Is or would that, or should we wait till the uh, general public comment for that? Good. Um, yeah, we, we, I can answer that. You can answer that. Um, Go ahead. So, through the mayor to the public, this is actually a clarification of the fees that were increased a couple of months ago, but it is a technical correction because in doing so, when we adopted the new ordinance, we actually picked up four or five items that Enfield does not enforce because we had a comparative chart from other communities. So what we're doing tonight is reversing the process and having another public hearing so we can delete those four or five that do not appear in the police department ticket book as published by the town of Enfield. So the fines for parking and fire lanes went up from 25 to 50. The residential parking fines went from 10 to 20. That's already been adopted. This is just to clean up a section that got past us. Okay, so we will wait till the regular uh, public comment then. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there anybody that would like to approach for the public hearing? <coughs> There's nobody, okay. I declare the public hearing over. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Enfield Town Council regular uh, meeting. Today is Monday, June 5th, 2023. Uh, the time is 7.40. Uh, this meeting can also be seen on YouTube. And um, once again, um, we will start tonight with our uh, prayer reflection. Uh, Councillor Finger. God, thank you for your patience, guidance, and love. For those who believe in their God, you are blessed, no matter what religion you believe in. For those who challenge the ways of praying shall be forgiven. In 1968, April 4th, a great man who believed in God and was the father of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot to death. In the same year, four months later, June 5th, another believer in God and was committed to helping the African Americans win their right to vote, this man was Senator Robert Kennedy. Their goals was to make our country equal in civil rights, but also believe in religion. It is a shame today that we don't know how much better our country would be in our town if they were able to fulfill and see how their dreams would have ended up. God bless America. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sheila, roll call, please. Councillor Finger. Sorry. Here. Councillor Hopkins. Here. Councillor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Mangini. Here. Councillor Nelson. Here. Councillor Pisner. Here. Councillor Santanella. Here. Councillor Ungeyer. Here. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Here. Mayor Crisati. Here. And Councillor Despard. Here. Eleven members are present, none are absent. Fire evacuation announcement. In the event of a fire, there are exits in the back of the chambers and to my left and the audience is right. Uh, exit through the doors, go downstairs and into the parking lot. Item five, minutes of proceeding uh, meetings. Um, do I have a motion to accept the minutes of the special meeting May 4th, 2023? Uh, Councillor Despard and a second by Councillor Mangini. Um, 
there any discussion on this by a show of hands? Uh, all in favor? Uh, opposed? Uh, one abstention. So we have 10 in favor, one abstention. Next, do I have a motion to accept the minutes of the regular meeting, May 15th, 2023? So Councilor second. Mangini and a second by Councilor Ungeyer. Any discussion on this? Yes. I have a correction. Um, at the end of uh, page 11, under my communications, it, it said she has been contacted by many people of the community, especially the elderly, and it says she will support the budget. It should say she will not support the budget. Thank you. Okay. All right, can we, um, by a show of hands, do we approve the amendment that will be made? Uh, and I would second that amendment. And a second, okay. That will be Councilor Hopkins, a second. All in favor? 11 in favor? Thank you. Okay, now we have to approve as amended now. Okay, all right, by a show of, show of hands, 11 in favor, thank you. Okay, item six, there are no special guests and we will be moving on to uh, public communications next. Uh, I just wanna remind uh, everybody in regard to public communications, um, You'll have five minutes to address the council. Uh, I would like you to please refrain from personal attacks or personnel matters. Um, we're not responding during public comment, but um, we could comment once the public communications are done. As a reminder, this is not a forum to air grievances or to discuss uh, town employees. When you come on up, please state your name and an address uh, for the record. And uh, once again, um, I, I will state um, that, you know, during the communications, um, I do have the right to um, end public communications if we don't do not follow these rules. Okay, so I just want everybody to be respectful. Thank you. Okay. All right, public communications, yep. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, counselors, um, Robert Bukowski, um, 21 Francis Avenue. Um, before I start, I'd, I'd like to um, ask permission to uh, I have a couple photos here that I'd like to display for the TV viewers. You've all seen them before. Um, I'd like uh, them reviewed by someone, maybe the town attorney, town manager, just to make sure they're kosher. I have uh, redacted the uh, face and genitalia on one of them, but I'd still like approval before I submit them to the TV viewers. I'm pretty sure I decline that offer, sir. Um, uh, just, you, Even the you lost me at genitalia. I'm sorry. Well, they're redacted. They're, they do not show the genitalia. The copies that you've you've received do, but these copies do not. They're the they're the TV. They're the uh, PJ PG version. I, I don't think we've ever had demonstrative aids. I think if we could keep it limited to public comment, that's probably for the best. Fair enough. Thank right. you. Thank you for your consideration. Anyway. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councilors. I'd like to discuss two things tonight related to the bad conduct issues that we've been having on Francis Avenue. The first issue is the topic of public urination, as is evidenced by the photos that I have here tonight that I will not be showing. <coughs> um, the second issue is an extension of the parking ban, as well as a request to implement a towing policy on Francis Avenue. This issue is prompted by the delays that will be that will occur due to the decision of Jimmy's Pub to appeal the recent ZBA decision to the Superior Court. This is going to make this whole thing a lot longer than we had all originally hoped for. 
So we need some solutions. It's going on and on and on. In case anyone doesn't know, the ZBA decision uh, that was done a few weeks ago has been appealed. So uh, the town of Enfield, if it chooses to defend the position, I'll get to that in a minute, will, will be in superior court. Um, these problems are not new, but we wanted to share these pictures with the public through YouTube and ETV. So use your imaginations, TV viewers. Um, this is what we're faced with. Does anybody think this is acceptable? Would anyone like this if it were happening on their street? And how long is it going to occur? Um, it's been well documented. There are still problems with loud speeding barroom traffic driving down the street and turning around in a cul-de-sac. But it's recently come to my attention that there are additional problems in the cul-de-sac as well. Um, we do not have an organized community group or Facebook page where we all get together and communicate. So this was a bit of a, of a surprise to me. Um, a man who lives at the bottom of the street recently told me that he has seen a total of seven cars stop in the cul-de-sac people have gotten out to urinate. So this problem is not occurring just at the top of the street. This problem has been occurring in the cul-de-sac as well. I don't think he's got a, a ring TV cam, a ring doorbell camera, but maybe he'll get one. Um, <clears throat> so the problem's not limited to the top of the street, and as if that really should matter, but the town council should have already put an end to this long ago. Let me now take a moment to refute an argument that I know is going to be made. And that argument is, this is not our problem. We have done all we can. This is now in the hands of planning and zoning. I know I'm going to hear that. <clears throat> Respectfully, I disagree. Let's start by properly defining the problem. The issue is on-street parking. <laughs> with emphasis on the words on street. Town Council has already implemented two temporary on street parking bans. How can anyone possibly say that the authority to regulate on street parking is not under the jurisdiction of the Town Council? The Town Council has already done it twice. You have the authority and the ability to correct this problem right now, tonight. You can do this with an extension of the parking ban an and an implementation of towing. So the request is resident parking only. Violators will be towed at their own expense. Let me remind you, we have submitted a petition a month ago signed by 26 residents of Francis Avenue who have requested resident parking only. All right. So I also have a couple questions for the town attorney and the town manager. To the town attorney, um, is the town of Enfield going to defend its position at Superior Court? And secondly, can you give us an approximate estimate on how long it might take for a court case like this to play out? To the town manager, um, can you please describe the town towing policy? Um, who has the contract? How many illegally parked cars were towed in Enfield in 2022? Or any really, any given period of time. Um, how many illegally parked cars were towed at the Scanic during 2022? Just to give us a sense of how this goes. Um, how is towing initiated? By resident call-in, uh, police drive-by, or tow truck drive-by. And please keep in mind that at times, Jimmy's Pub, <clears throat> when calls are made for ticketing, people will go out and move their cars from the uh, street to Jimmy's Pub parking lot before the cops arrive. Excuse me, Mr. Burke, your five minutes are up. Wow, okay. Um, I'm on my last page. Give me a minute or I'll come back. Come back, please. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Oh. oh, yeah, the pictures. Oh. 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bobby Burial. I live at Four Highland Park in Enfield, Connecticut. I'm here uh, to discuss uh, some of the issues uh, uh, happening in our neighborhood, and uh, there are a few of us who uh, would also like to discuss as well. So, um, being a, a product of the Enfield public school system, even though I, I was living in New Britain for a while, um, I certainly did follow the town news on infield paths and whatnot, and I've heard a lot of things happening with regards to uh, Jimmy's Pub, some of the complaints and whatnot. So, um, having to find a place to live, my friend uh, Jeremy Cody took me in. He, he's a really great dude um, and a great roommate, uh, but like, I was a little nervous at first because being 100 feet away from Jimmy's Pub, I was worried about being up all night because of the noise or being unable to get down the street uh, because of the parking issues and whatnot. And I'm not gonna lie, I was surprised, pleasantly surprised. Because even though I live 100 feet away from Jimmy's Pub, and keep in mind, I don't have AC, the window's open, I don't hear noise. It's quiet. I mean, the only noise you hear are the birds chirping in the morning. I, I mean, it, it, it is indeed, at least from my perspective, living literally two buildings away from Jimmy's Pub, uh, uh, quite a peaceful neighborhood. And I, I'm not trying to diminish um, those who, who might say otherwise. I, I mean, um, just because it's my perspective, that doesn't mean it's a whole picture. But certainly from my vantage point, um, uh, Jimmy's presents no issues to the neighborhood. And I, I do want to say that part of the reason why I'm here is because a lot of my friends and uh, uh, roommates and people who, you know, neighbors on the streets, uh, they, they did get tickets, uh, $10 tickets. And I was alarmed at the fact that, like, the police, from what I've been told and other people have been, well, heard and been told, is the fact that the police has ticketed everyone on the street. And the police, a police officer even told uh, one person who went to the police department to um, get the ticket nullified that uh, they have a policy of just ticketing everyone and people who come in and um, uh, to appeal uh, their tickets, they, they're just nullifying right there on the spot because the police were evidently told that they're, they're not even running plates or anything to check if they're residents. And, I, I, I don't really think that that's the best policy to have, and I'm deeply concerned about um, that. I, I think that, uh, furthermore, I, I don't really think that the town of Enfield should be wasting its time and energy on implementing parking bans on the streets surrounding Jimmy's Pub, because, I, I mean, the most, like, I would say 80%, maybe 90% of the people who park on the street are residents or people who, who are invitees of the residents, like girlfriends, boyfriends, uh, family members and whatnot. I mean, most people who um, are going to Jimmy's Pub are indeed parking either in their law or the big law across the street. So I don't really see any issues. So I, I do want to um, thank you all for taking the time to hear from me today. And um, I hope you have a great meeting. Okay, thank you. Kelly Himmler, 10 Harford Ave. I'm not here to talk about Jimmy's Pub. <laughs> um, just a, a couple issues, and I'm going to ask questions. I know you can't answer, but I'm just going to ask them. I see that there's a resolution on the agenda for open space ordinance, which um, that's great. Um, but I, I combed through the agenda and could not actually find the resolution. So I'm just wondering why it wasn't made public. And I do kind of pay attention to stuff. Um, I, uh, was there a public hearing? I, maybe I missed it. So um, I think that um, the open space, I believe it's also the 490 ordinance, or maybe they're two different things. And uh, that makes a lot of sense. That would probably solve a lot of the problems. Um, another issue, there's also something on there about the Strand and the Lamania Center. Um, there's also a parcel uh, to Chapel Road that was uh, actually given to the town and that's for recreational. So I just hope that that's not part of what you're trying to sell because that wouldn't be right. Um, the other thing is uh, with the uh, tax assessor issue, um, 
I haven't seen the entire report, but I was glad that I was here to, to hear the presentation. Um, I find it interesting that um, he said that the assessor is not perfect, they make mistakes, but it doesn't seem like the BAA was given that same grace. And they're actually not professionals like the assessor, they're just citizens like all of us who are looking out for Enfield citizens. So I, I just, it, I'm sure the report is very fair, but it just seemed like the assessor was just given a lot more, a lot more grace, and, and I don't agree with that. Um, actually, the, the whole assessor department really should be erring on the side of the taxpayers because we're paying the bills. You know, it's disrespectful otherwise. So um, those are my couple questions about the agenda and my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Melanie Dubiel, 4 Francis Avenue in Enfield. I just want to comment on the urinating because I was out in my front of my house when um, one of the incidents happened. I came home from a friend's house about quarter after 11 and I had my dog's runners out there. So I was out there rolling up the runners and in the front of my house, I watched the guy come out of Pizza Palace parking lot. He walked down the street to where I'm at number four. So he walked down the street to diagonal across from us, got into his car, went all the way up to the stop sign at the top of the street, backed in reverse all the way down the street, got out of his car right in front of me my ring spotlight is on in the front of our house because I was rolling up my dog's runners. Proceeded to get out of his car and urinate right in front of me. These people have no morals. At their house, the ring spotlight was on. That was a male gentleman. There is a female that got out last weekend, and these are all reported with the police department. She gets out and with the ring camera spotlight on, again, urinates right in the middle of the, the yard. You know, this is, and that's three times in three weekends that different people are doing it. But they're not even doing it when nobody's around. They're doing it. I was right out front. I proceeded to go get my husband. I confronted him. I yelled to him because my daughter was on her way home. I went to get my husband. He came out. He went over to the guy. The guy told him to F off, went up the street. Ken Bednar was out in his parking lot. So my husband had gone up to him because he's got cameras and asked if he had cameras for the plate readers. Ken Bednar told my husband to go call his brothers and figure it out. So these people do not have any morals at all. They're doing this. I have a 17-year-old daughter, and she's on her way home with her brother. I don't need my daughter seeing a guy peeing in front of our house right in the middle of the street. You know, in front of their house, a, a female pulls her pants down and just pees right in. The spotlights are on. It's not even like they're trying to hide it. They're doing and they're walking out of Jimmy's pub. And to the gentleman that had said about there's no problems on Highland Park, then if there's no problems there, then just make Francis Avenue resident parking only and let Highland Park have it. If there's no issues there, they're not complaining, then have Highland Park, let them park over there and just have Francis Avenue resident parking only. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Could I, could I sure. talk please? Uh, Susan Budd to Francis Avenue. And I just want to reiterate the problems we've had since November. We've been fighting this. I've sent all of you guys videos. And two weekends ago, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm being, you know, you just fall asleep and you're being awakened again by people yelling in the streets. On top of, I don't really appreciate having people using my yard as a porta potty. It's not right. And I'm just going to ask one question on it. I, I think I already know the answer. There's probably not one of you that would accept that if it was going on in your yards. It's, right. it's not right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Elaine DeRoy and I live at 23 Francis Avenue. I was up here last month, I believe, or the month before, regarding the driving on our street. 
which is loud. They go up and down our street. The other thing is last week I was walking on my street like I do uh, often. I walked down to the end of the street near the curb by where that sign is. There's a used condom there and um, alcohol bottle on the ground. We have children on our street that walk up there to go to school on the school bus. That is so improper to have something to see that on the ground where other children can see it. I don't believe any of you either would like that on your street or have any of your grandchildren or children see it. It's so disrespectful. All we want to do is have a sign on our street, no parking, tow at their own expense violators, and let it be. That's all we want. We don't care that he has a, a restaurant there or have people there. It's fine, but let our street be quiet. We don't need all this commotion on our street. We don't appreciate it, and I don't think any of you would appreciate it if it was on your street. That's all I need. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Rachel Baird. I represent the individual members of the Board of Assessment Appeals. My office is in Rocky Hill, Connecticut, 2234 Silas Dean Highway. The individual members of the Board of Assessment Appeals are here tonight. Chairman Thomas Tyler, Donna Duvanowski, and Lori Longy. The BAA members believe, and rightfully so, that but for their public expression of concerns about the tax assessor in their May 28th, 2022 minutes, that this council would not have voted on August 29th, 2022 to hire a law firm to conduct an independent review of the assessment and revaluation process. And for their efforts, a report discussed previously in a meeting, in a special meeting, today entitled Independent Review and Evaluation of Town of Enfield 2021 Revaluation Prepared for the Town of Enfield June 1st, 2023. That's what I'll be referring to as the report. And for their efforts, a report calls the BAA members unnecessarily adversarial and hyperbolic. It accuses them of exaggeration but at the same time, when it cannot be avoided, confirms that some of their claims about the tax assessor's conduct during the revaluation 2021 reassesses their claims that some of his conduct was not proper. For example, the tax assessor, who is Mr. Helms' use of soil science to assess farmland when he does not have the qualifications of a soil scientist. According to the report at page 52, quote, the first and most obvious issue is whether the assessor possesses the knowledge and or expertise required to properly identify the land class based upon the soils and the land's limitations. There's no evidence that Mr. Helms has this expertise. But in most cases, the BAA member concerns are brushed aside. For example, page 26 discusses statements by two BAA members when they were being interviewed by attorney Coppola. It discusses their observations of Mr. Helms's hiding a recorder in a coat rack at one BAA hearing. They presented a picture of the hidden recorder to the interviewer. <clears throat> I actually have the pictures here that were presented, but I understand we don't show them. But I do have them. But this information is characterized in the report as follows, quote, during our investigation, Mr. Helms was accused of hiding recording devices in the BAA hearing room. Based upon the totality of the evidence, we find these accusations to be exaggerated at best, 
Nonetheless, under no circumstance should recording devices be planted or clandestinely placed in the BAA hearing room. This is not a Freedom of Information Act issue. This is surreptitiously placing a recording device in a place separate from yourself to record conversations that may or may not be part of the official proceedings. There's actually a state law against this, and it's 53A-189. No person, a person is guilty of eavesdropping when he unlawfully engages in mechanical overhearing of a conversation. What is mechanical overhearing? It means leaving a recording device without the consent of at least one party to the conversation and recording information and communications. This surreptitiously hidden recording device by Mr. Helms was not in his possession when he was recording, so there was not at least one party consenting to the recording of information, and we don't know what it recorded, if it recorded private conversations, but this was not followed up in the report. It was called exaggeration at best. I don't know what it was referring to at worst, but if it's exaggerated, exaggeration at best, then there's an inference there that the two BA that the two BAA members were not telling the truth when they have the evidence that the recorder was surreptitiously hidden. And my five minutes is up, so I can come back. Okay. Thank you. Donna Dubanowski, 23 Betty Road. Rachel's going to speak for me this evening. And I would know. Excuse me. Yes. Rachel's going to speak for me this evening, I mentioned. Oh, you have to say your name. I did. I said Donna Dubanowski, 23 Betty Road, and Rachel is going to speak for me this evening. Excuse me. We've done that before. I, I don't. I, uh, this is She's speaking for me. I, we had. This is Rachel Baird. We had planned to do this with each one of the three members. Why can't she speak for me? It's my five minutes. I will refer it to our town attorney. Yeah, I, I've never seen this one. It's. Uh, there's no book you can look to for an answer. But I have to, an I, attorney I, that I'm asking. Well, I think it's the prerogative of the chair, quite frankly. Yeah. I, I've never seen this before. So you're going so, to deny me my right? You can speak. I've asked you to let, listen to her. But you, but you can speak. But I've asked you to listen to Rachel for me. Just as a just as a question here, a point of order question. So. Uh, I don't think it's explicitly prohibited in our procedures. It is, I think, normally the default rule of the chair. Um, if there are six votes to allow it, that might be worth considering. Why no. Order? No. Why not? No. Well, I, I will. I will allow. I will allow it. Thank you. I appreciate that. I do. Thank you. So th thank you for that, Mayor. And to continue, my name is Rachel Baird. I ended with a quote from page 26 of the report where the independent review is characterized as an investigation. The quote was, during our investigation, Mr. Helms was accused of hi hiding recording devices. And my next comment is, by the way, was this a review or an investigation? The terms seem to be used interchangeably. 
I will say that during one of the interviews of Attorney Tyler, it seemed more of an investigation complete with interrogation techniques, and I invite all of you to listen to that recording or view it on the video, where it seemed more like a investigation than an independent review, and I'll return to that subject hopefully later. Furthermore, while stating that the BAA members acted in good faith, the report also states that interviews with town officials and the documentary evidence showed the BAA members disregarded the law applicable to the assessment of real and personal property, page five. Disregarding the law, that means you know the law and choose to act contrary to the law. You, disregard, you disregarded a most serious allegation far different from the leeway afforded Mr. Helms. The report explains his conduct as follows. It is a simple reality that municipal assessors are fallible. They make mistakes. They misinterpret legal provisions and from time to time overlook critical facts. So it appears that BAA members disregard the law, but Mr. Helms only misinterprets the law. As a final recommendation in the report, Bircham Moses offers, quote, the BAA should not attempt to interpret legal documents such as the Nutmeg Solar Tax Stabilization Agreement. If the BAA has questions or concerns regarding applicability or interpretation of a legal document, it should contact the town attorney. That's at page 72. But isn't it Mr. Helms who has been misinterpreting and the BAA that disregards? Purportedly, the BAA just doesn't care what the law is, so why would they ask the town attorney for the law? It's Mr. Helms who seems to misinterpret the law. So why isn't he asking the town attorney for an interpretation? I, I've, I've excuse me. A point of order. Well, you're, um, you're attacking um, a town right. employee, mm -hmm. and we can't do that. You can't. He's not present. We should set up a special meeting. Oh, okay. And I believe the BAA absolutely has the right to speak. I understand your concerns, but to address it here without him present is not right. So, again, yeah. we had no choice but to move to an executive session, and I would also like the same opportunity for the BAA to do the same thing with you present. And I think that is the time and place to have these discussions where we can go back and forth, because we can't hear, and we have a town employee you're talking about, which is not allowed. I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I was not aware that well, there was we're, going to be a special meeting about this. Well, if we're, I we're, we're, made aware... We're, we're not going to, um, well, I'm not going to allow it, all right? Okay, it's, it's you know, I gave you a, a common courtesy that you're speaking for Ms. Dubinowski, but we are not. Stop. And I stated this at the beginning of the meeting. I will end public communications right now if this continues. Okay. I did not know that there was a special meeting planned for the BAA. I thought that this was their only opportunity to speak on the record in public in response to what the report says about them. Are we not concerned with what the report says about the BAA members? I will tell you that you, you, your five minutes no, are, concerned. we are very concerned. There is no question about it. We are concerned. And we will be happy to set up a meeting and, and discuss this with you. So, so was that meeting already planned and I just didn't know about it and missed it? No, I, I'm sure you know about it. As a, Mr. Okay, Mayor? So it has been planned? Mr. Mayor? He says it's in no, a back and forth. And you so say, it's not sure, a back I knew about it. As a, as a I, point of order, can yeah. I just say, I think it's, it's, it's acceptable to talk about the Board of Education. Uh, the BAA. The problem here is it's a personnel issue if you start attacking a town employee while he's not present. So if you keep your, I mean, I think if she keeps her comments to uh, the BAA conduct, I don't think that's a problem. Well, as, that, as, as long think, as it's, I think their issues oh. is deeper than public communication, yes. and thus we need a special meeting yes. for yeah. them, what, which what, was not set up. It was and, not, okay. And it yeah. will be, what? under Councilman Communications, I will request that that happens, because I'd like to have both sides in the room. Yes. And let's get to the bottom of this, because unfortunately the taxpayers are paying the price for it, and it's ridiculous. So I understand what you're trying to do. I know I, I support a special meeting with everybody in the room. Uh, and, and that's one thing that we were going to be discussing later on. 
All right, because that, that was one of the options that we do have. One of the options is we can discuss the issues with your group and yourself, and we can also discuss it with the assessor. Okay, because yes, I do and have I would entertain other comments that. in here about yeah. the tax assessor. Yeah, There's and, no and I would definitely entertain that. You know, I would like to hear your comments, but this is Thank public you. communications. And one thing that I did state was that we weren't going to be airing grievances and we weren't going to be talking about uh, town employees. But we would be happy to entertain a meeting with, with you. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to separate the remainder of my presentation to call out what could be called comments about a public employee, Mr. Helms. And by the way, I didn't realize he wasn't even here. I don't even know what he looks like. So so that was not that was not a thought to do anything behind his back. But um, yes, I do believe that the three members of the BAA uh, should have an opportunity to respond to a lot of what is in this report and clarify things. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things, and I'm not going to have a back and forth with you, but during our communications and, and, and our responses, that we would entertain meeting with you as a group to discuss this. Okay. And, in, a, in, a, in a meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, So I, I am going to I am going to add one thing, and if and if it if it brushes close to anything of a personnel nature, which I don't think it does, so I'm not trying to skirt anything, but I just wanted to bring up um, one problem that the BAA is facing currently, and that has to do with the 48 revisions made made by the tax assessor. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't. I, it's a special possible. meeting. Yeah. We, okay. we, 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 yeah. <laughs> and we, we, we will be glad to, to meet. Okay. And I would be glad to listen to everything that you do have to say. And, and it won't be and timed. Every, correct. No, right. Perfect. Correct. Thank All right. You. So, I mean, I've never, we've never experienced somebody speaking for somebody else in a public communication. You're not going to have the, the, the proper time for us to be able to do this in this type of setting. <laughs> We will set up an appointment with you in a meeting so that we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. That's what I said. I went back and forth. 100%. 100%. 100%. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Jeremy Cody. Uh, I'm from Four Highland Park. I've lived here for 10 years about. I just want to say, I'll make it quick. I'm against the, the parking ban thing because we're in a house with five cars. We all work different schedules and it's very difficult for us. I didn't even know there was gonna be a towing thing, so that's even worse <laughs> for our situation. And there's multiple multifamily houses on that street. So I just want you guys to take that into consideration. And I, the, with the resident parking thing, I didn't think it was going to be a big deal until the other night. My neighbor to my left and my neighbor upstairs both got tickets. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't. I wish I had more feedback or anything. I just want to say I disapprove of disapprove of it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Donna. Don Suzak, 35 South Road. Um, I guess what I, I, not around a lot, but I've heard a lot of, um, I guess, scuttlebutt about um, 2 Chapel Street. And I guess what I did is I asked for the minutes from June of June 3rd of 2013 and May 20th, 2013. And this, this piece of property was purchased by the town. I came onto the council in 2013, and that's really what I've come to share with you. I'm gonna leave these minutes for everybody to read at their leisure. Um, that property was used, um, open space money was used to purchase that property. Um, 
the parking was an anticipated part of the expansion of the park that was there with the Lomania Center. I sat as the chair for leisure. Matt Coppler was the town manager at the time. Matt was very conscientious about this design of the parking should not infringe upon any of this land that should be designated as open space. And he specifically said, if we don't use this for open space or it's sold to somebody else or it's gone, that money need to be returned to open space because that money is to buy land. I mean, even this, you know, from when you read this, you'll find that this was a stretch of the use of the open space money. So with that, I'd like, you know, good luck with your project down there. But I did want to, you know, give some clarification, give you anecdotally what I dealt with. And we did eventually not put parking in there because the requirements of the green space in the parking lot made it such that it was cost prohibitive to add any parking to the Angela Lamagna Center. So sometimes we um, kind of zone ourselves out of being able to do anything. And I didn't really want to comment on this, but actually I grew up on six Highland Park. So I'll give you a little difference between Francis Avenue and Highland Park. Highland Park, the initial part of Highland Park is multifamily. So there's always a lot of on-street parking till you get like about halfway down the street. So of course, everybody's gonna park on Francis Avenue where everybody is individual homes and they have longer driveways and their cars are in the driveway. So that's the open part of parking. So when you listen to the comments from the audience, you have to understand that whether these two streets are next to each other, there's a substantial difference in accessibility of parking on those two different streets. So, and thanks for listening to me and uh, good luck everybody. And I'll give the minutes to Sheila. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Tom Tyler, AT Bridge Lane, Enfield, Chairman of the uh, Board of Assessment Appeals. And I was very heartened to hear the I'll start over. Tom Tyler, 18 Bridge Lane, Enfield, Connecticut. I'm also a chairman of the Board of Assessment Appeals. And um, I'm very heartened to hear that uh, we're going to have an opportunity to rebut a lot of the stuff that's in this uh, report. We don't feel as though we were given anywhere near of a fair opportunity to even discuss any of these, these uh, allegations and unfounded conclusions against us. We feel as though we've been smeared, and that's why we're so angry. And uh, we're just trying, we're volunteers trying to do a job that people have asked us to do. And uh, I had been on here before for a few years. I had gotten off until then I get a call, and you'll remember, Mr. Mayor, you asked me to come back and serve because of the problem we were having in town with this revaluation that was ongoing. So I agreed, I came back, I've done the best I possibly can, all in good faith, and it hurts me to see um, a report that is so one-sided, it's just, it defies belief. When you look at the number of people and who they spoke with and, and uh, came up with, they're all tax assessor people. He says that uh, and Mario, who I, who I respect, but uh, Mario also uh, puts forth this report as though he's deciding our decisions and he's reviewing our decisions. I will tell you, I have a quote from him, and he's here. He can deny it if he wishes. I'll play it for you, where he said that he may disagree with some of our decisions or all of their decisions. His his rulings would be or his opinions irrelevant. If he stood in our shoes and rendered something different than us, so what, he says. No big deal. It's the BAA that rules on this stuff. He didn't know exactly what's in our head in terms of divining what these conclusions are. My problem, of course, is that we didn't get contacted till February. We should have been contacted first and given him the information that we obtained 
that we put in our report, we, we didn't just make up this stuff. We had people that came before us. There were 400 some odd appeals. They came before us and we felt a civic duty to try and help by producing a report that the town could look at and hopefully make some changes. The interesting thing is all of the allegations we made in that report, or virtually all of them, have been validated in this. The only difference is they're minimized. So, well, yes, he um, shouldn't have been there tape recording, um, but it's no big deal because uh, he, he could do it. We knew he could do it. Our posture at the very beginning was, yeah, you can do it, but what you should do it is a different thing. And respecting the dignity and, uh, and, and um, privacy, even under this circumstance, for people to come before us in a quasi-judicial atmosphere, first time we've seen many of these people, they're nervous, they're scared, but they're, they're here because they, they don't know what else to do. They have tremendous grievances. So thank you very much for having that, and I would urge you to please to withhold judgment on thinking, oh, this is great, we're at the bottom of it. You're not at the bottom of it. So we would love the opportunity to be able to present you our side of it with some facts and substantiations. But remember this, when Mario may differ in our opinions, in his own words, so what? It doesn't matter, his views are irrelevant. So as you're reading his comments on our decision, remember, that's his words. He's here, he can come up and deny it if he wants. I'll come back and play the tape from my interview. But thank you very much, and, and again, I look forward to uh, our opportunity to rebut and then move on in the best interest of the, everybody in the town of Enfield, especially the taxpayers. So thank you very much. Lori Longy, 1427 Enfield Street. Um, I'm actually going to talk about the open space because I saw it on the agenda as well, but I, there was no information at all about what it comprised, how many acres. There was all of a sudden it showed up in as a resolution. Um, in the PA 490 book, which is like the Bible that everybody's been talking about, I know this book inside and out, um, I had it with me. And it said that open space in certain towns, uh, Ellington was uh, excess of five acres. Um, Colebrook, they did land in excess of the zoned lot size. Um, Colebrook, double the minimum lot size. Um, Putnam, five acres to qualify. Uh, Ridgefield, twice the zone lot size. We, as the BAA, did hear about open space and the components that we heard was the people were put into open space five assessors ago, not the previous assessor, the one before that. This was like done in the 1960s. And so that played a big factor on, you know, we don't know what, why they put them in there, but they put them in there and they stayed in there for 60 years. And then all of a sudden they came out. So this was a much bigger thing than like the typical, oh, somebody put them in four years ago, now we're gonna take them out. Questions that I had was, in some of these towns, um, if you're looking for five acres or 10 acres, are these properties have to be touching each other? Do they have to be under the same common ownership? That's why I thought that this was gonna go to more of a public hearing so people could discuss the people that knew about it. Um, we have some of the people that came in had four and five parcels. Some people had little tiny parcels. Um, I don't even know if you know the parcels that were removed because we only heard appeals on a couple of them that want to be reinstated, but we didn't hear about the ones that were removed that didn't know that there was any options. So I just think that there should be a little bit more looking into it because there's always a little bit more backstory that you might not be aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I can go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Marissa Bedard, 18 Rocket Run. 
Um, we have a couple of things that we want to discuss, so I'm going to make my point pretty quick. Um, thing that I would like to bring up to you guys um, is in regards to the photos that the Buds and the Dubials are presenting every week. Um, on April 2nd, my family decided to host a meeting at the business with our family, the neighbors that are primarily involved, and then Ellen. Um, it was in hopes that like getting outside of this room, we would come to a little bit more of a solution that's like productive for both parties involved um, within the meeting. Uh, we came up with mainly like her and I, we shot out some ideas that we thought would be something worth a shot. Um, one of the things that we did discuss was the fact that we both worked there six days a week. So we know almost everybody that comes in and out of that business. Um, I have yet to see any of the photos or videos that they're saying is happening. I'm not discrediting that these things are happening. Um, but. I said, you can have my phone number. I'm here almost every single day. Or if I'm not here, she's here. Come over. We can, if I have pictures and videos of this, I can make sure that we don't want those people there anyway. So I can make sure that these people are not coming back and I know who's doing this. Still, months later, have not seen anything. I find out about these instances at these meetings. Um, on May 28th, I was, I woke up to a message on Instagram um, from somebody that I kind of know, but it was a, do you mind if we pass just a, it's a screenshot of my message. Um, it's a, it was just a photo. I clicked on the photo and it says on my friend's ring camera, LOL. I said, what am I looking at? And he said, a girl peeing on the side of a truck by your restaurant. And I said, we asked your friends to send us this stuff personally months ago and we've yet to see anything from them. They can send it to the town or call the police from here. And they go, they aren't mad about it. It's just funny. Thought you would find it funny if you know the girl. And I said, I don't find it funny. So respectfully, I'm not getting involved. Um, so this is the photo that they are referencing tonight. Um, I just like to mention, I, this is the only time that I've ever seen anything and I don't find it funny and I don't think it's cool that I'm getting this from somebody that they're associated with. But. What is Sydney Bedard to Oakwood Drive? I don't understand what sending an Instagram direct message to her from a random person that's not associated with this problem at all is going to do. Every, I, I'm 99% sure these neighbors have my dad's phone number. He hasn't gotten one single thing. He's there every night closing himself. Like, just give him a call. He's out there. And um, also in terms of kind of what Melanie said a little bit ago with the license plate reader thing, how she, her husband, Paul, had asked my dad to get that license plate. First of all, we don't have any license plate license plate reader on the side of the building is only in the front so every car that comes into the parking lot those are the ones that get scanned but in terms of him saying call your brothers that's not what happened he uh said as a private citizen to a private citizen it's your right it's your choice to call the police if you'd like to i can't do anything about that that's and then after my dad had said that he said game on ken game on that's just where, is this a game? What is so funny about this? This is a livelihood. This is like, look around, look around. We've been doing this since November. If this is a game, that's just absurd. There's so many instances where in a Friday afternoon, it's 3 p.m., I walk outside of my car and there's cones and ropes just blocking number two's house. That's not right, we all know that. It doesn't start till 10 p.m. Not okay. I think and where we're frustrated is in this meeting that we've had privately with them, we came out with some solutions that I thought were very productive. We tried it out for a couple of weeks. We had street monitors in place from 10, 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. They would all take turns wearing a yellow vest. They would stand at the top of Francis Ave, and they would make sure that if there was a car coming down the street, if there was multiple people in the car, they would unload at the top of the street and send the driver down, and the street monitor would go with them, make sure that they would come right back, and then vice versa at the end of the night. When they were going out to their car, they would send just the driver down, and the car would come pick them up. No problems. Then we also suggested that since we are there until 2 o'clock in the morning, because we close, um, that it would probably be beneficial if we park all of our employees in front of their houses so that there's no noise, there's no traffic, there's no littering, so that they aren't having these issues all night long. Because we leave quietly, my dad yells at us every week, he's like, just please keep it down when we leave the building, don't slam the doors, keep it down, keep it quiet. I thought that was a pretty like feasible option. It worked for a couple of weeks, we had no issues. Um, we 
presented more things like this. My dad said, I'll get a golf cart if I have to shuttle people, but nothing. It wasn't wasn't really good enough, so. Yeah. Good? Yeah, I think okay. good. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Phil Dumont, 13 Celtic Court. Uh, I spoke last at the last meeting talking about how we develop budgets. I've been in numbers my whole life. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm kind of digging all the time for numbers. I'm immersed in them all the time, trying to make sense of them. And trying to look at this last budget, um, I've got recommendations for the, and I shouldn't say cycle because I think the cycle is every month. Um, I've done some data here in, in the last eight years. This town budget has gone from $120 million to $145 million. It's a $25 million increase. It's roughly $3 million a year if you want to just put it in straight, straight line terms. Usually when we develop budgets, and that's why the formats that I saw in the documents kind of troubled me because I don't, I don't develop a budget based on a budget versus a budget versus a budget. I want to see actuals. I've got a worksheet that I've done the actuals since 2015 that I got off the town website. I want to dig deeper. Um, and that's where I see the $25 million increase. So without knowing this year's actuals, I have to assume the revised budget is the actual for 2023. We approved a budget for $7.6 million increase in one year. And you look back at the last eight years, it's phenomenal. And do I say it's wrong? I don't know enough in the details, but I certainly need to, we'll get into the details a lot more. The other thing is in the, if you look at the Board of Ed budget, and don't everybody get sensitive about a Board of Ed, but if you look, you gotta look at drivers of all the departments. What drives a department's being? Is what service or product they provide, mostly services here. Who's their customer? Well, the customer is the taxpayer. How do they serve the customer? How can they serve the customer better and more efficiently? That should be the goal. I would kind of look at this as every year you come into a budget for a zero increase. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but you say, hmm, how can we do things better at the same cost? Contractual obligations, I get that, however. I, I hear that and read that all the time. It says, well, it's a fixed cost. Well, if you take economics 101, fixed costs are in the short term, variable costs are in the short term, but in the long term, all costs are variable. So you gotta look ahead and see what's going on. I would also add here the only, I got off the state websites when at the end of the last meeting, someone said what the Board of Ed budget was based on. The customer of the Board of Ed is the students. And in last year's revised budget it was 4,913. In this 2024 budget is 4,600. That's a 300 or six point something percent decrease in one year. Since 2015, the student populations decreased by 11%. It's trending, except for those first two years, it's trended downward ever since. That's, that's a tough, tough thing to deal with. And so I'm kind of looking here, I'm gonna continue to dig. I have so much more information to get into, but I would, I, I would like to, to see more actuals in this. I'd like to see actuals on the grand list. I'd like to see actuals on the expenditures. Frankly, budgets are, it, to me, a budget is a guideline. And I'd leave you with this. The recently approved budget is, uh, is, is quite large, but view it as a credit card with a credit limit. And I would urge all of you for, to tell everybody in there to not spend the limit. You need to push downward on this thing, because I, I frankly think it's kind of, my initial gut feel is that it's too big. And with all that said, I was going through all these numbers and I said, well, well how does it affect me? So I, I went and I looked and I said, I'm the calm before the storm here. In the next month or two, you're gonna have people in here screaming. 
it's a nine, over a 9% increase on my house, and it's 5%, nearly a 5% increase on my cars. So I'll leave you with that because I'm sure there will be many more in future meetings. So thanks for listening. Uh, excuse, excuse me. Yeah. Is there anybody else before Lucia? Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, I did. Lucia, come on up. Lucia Lafay, 54 Kimberly Drive, Enfield. Also chairman of the Enfield Veterans Council. I'm here to talk just a few minutes about the uh, Memorial Day parade and ceremony that we just had. I want to thank everyone that participated, the town's elected officials that were able to attend, the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, all different organizations that took time to attend the, the parade and ceremony that we had. And I also want to throw out a, a big thank you to the town departments that helped out. I mean, without the police department for traffic control, buildings and grounds to set up the green forest, you know, none of this would happen. But mostly I want to thank the residents of Enfield that came out to pay respect and remember the veterans that gave all for this country. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to have the parade, the barbecues, the sales, and everything else. So thank you to all the residents of Enfield, the town officials, and the town departments for helping us to remember our veterans. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to approach the council? For the first time. For the first time. Okay, we have uh, five minutes left of public communications. I'm going to let him. You, you, that is correct, the one hour limit. Phil Duman on 13 Celtic Crew. I, I forgot to get to the good part. Following up on our veterans recognition and the parade, I got to give kudos to, unfortunately, we got bad weather, but that town wide tag sale generated a lot of interest. And it really seemed to be well, well done for the food shelf. Uh, the library sale I was at over the weekend was tremendous. The new venue is great. It certainly makes it a lot easier for all, everybody in there working it. And then I, I've been fortunate enough to follow a little bit of the, uh, the infield teams. And so the, the, soft, the girls softball team went well into the playoffs and did well. But I was, I was attending the Enfield High baseball games at, at, in Hartford at Yargos Park. That was a great venue, and I, I just feel so excited for the kids to be able to have an opportunity to play on a field like that, being in high school. But I attended two games last week, and uh, the uh, counselor Sakala's son hit the game-winning hit against Norwalk in the bottom of the seventh. It was an exciting game. And then the next day, they, they played West Haven, went 10 innings, and these kids represented Enfield so well, such great sportsmanship. So that's pretty much all I want to say about that. So. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for one, one more. One minute. Just give a minute to Robert Burkowski, 21 Francis. <clears throat> Um, there's been a lot of lot of discussions back and forth between the neighborhood and Jimmy's Pub. We've all tried hard, but this is going to Superior Court, so, you know. Um, anyway, uh, last page. So, so look, uh, please keep in mind that at times Jimmy's Pub and police are uh, out. Anyway, um, final points. Right now, even with the parking ban in effect, Jimmy's Pub customers can legally park on half of Cook, Virginia, Woodlawn, Sunset, Fremont, Montana, and Colony. But they choose not to. There are other streets available right now that do not have parking bans. Um, and after about two weeks of towing, this problem on Francis Avenue might be totally resolved. 
as soon as they get the message that the town's serious about towing, it could all go away. And please, I encourage everybody, I encourage you to lift the parking ban on Highland Park tonight and let everybody park there. I'm glad they're happy about the whole thing. Um, and r the neighborhood has tried very hard to work with Jimmy's Pub, but it seems to be a situation like this from uh, Jimmy's Pub's point of view. Let's work really, really hard and work together and do it my way. Yeah. That's the attitude. And it ain't working. It's going to court. And, and that's a sad thing, but it is what it is. Thank you very much. Okay, th thank you very much. <clears throat> Counselor, uh, excuse me, public communications is over. Uh, next, uh, Counselor Communications. Um, I'm just going to make one comment. I'll come back, but just to start off our, our comments um, to the town manager, uh, I would like to uh, officially make that proposal to have the uh, be set up a meeting with the, uh, the BAA so that we can uh, discuss their rebuttal on the report. Okay, that's that's the first thing that I want to state. Okay, yes, question. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll open up counselor commu uh, counselor communications. Thank you. Just quickly, Councilor Mangini. Thank you um, to through our mayor to our town manager. I have been re uh, receiving requests for status update on the band shell. Maybe at your um, delivery, you could touch base on that and then also I want to thank you and staff for addressing the uh, Thomas Abbey situation um, you know as long as the town is um, going to take uh, the responsibility back to do the cleanup I will find a group or an organization to do the pavers we'll take care of that but that I think is more than fair so thank you. I know it was a busy time for you, and you, um, you know, took the helm and you dove, dove right into it, and you got some answers. Thank you. Okay. Thank. Thank you, uh, Councilor Finger. And then. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, first thing I got to say is uh, tonight uh, the council is going to be voting on the Ask Me Local 1029 contract, um, so I will be abstaining from that vote because that union is the union that I belong to, and I do not want to uh, make them mad at me if I did vote no. Um, but um, the last thing, one of the things I gotta say, is it's gonna be a, a brief minute, but uh, since the Board of Education meeting, uh, when we did the budget, I've had a few teachers uh, email me with their concerns about the way I voted and why. Um, and why I voted no for the kids. And after explaining myself to them and why I did not vote against the kids, but I was not happy with the way that it went down and how the superintendent presented it and the actual actual numbers of how I expected a, a, a budget presentation to be, to be presented to us. But as the Board of Education member said in their meeting following a no is a no, and they're absolutely right. But my following statement is to is directly to our superintendent, Chris Drenzik. Please try and understand why, Chris, I voted that way. But I will tell you this. For the past two years, you have been through a personal hardship and a professional challenges in your job. You, in my opinion, have stayed strong and focused on what I consider two years that most people would have walked away from, but you stood your ground. You are a very good superintendent and a strong voice for your students. I have, I have, I have to say that you have always had my respect and always will. Thank you very much, Chris, for what you do for the town of Enfield and the Board of Education. And that's all I have, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councilor Ungar. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I did have some comments about the evaluation and uh, about the BAA, but I'm going to save that for when we meet. Um, at our last town council meeting, we had several residents that came and spoke regarding the proposed budget and the effect that it may have on our school district. 
it was imputed that the Republican caucus did not support our Enfield Public Schools. We were accused of cutting staff, cutting lunches, and nothing could be farther from the truth. It is unequivocal that we all support our Enfield School District. To accuse otherwise is simply uninformed. The following has been explained, however, I think it needs to be explained again. This past year, the state funded the Enfield Public Schools so that all students would receive a free lunch. Like many mandates, the state decided it would no longer cover free lunches in Enfield. So our school district decided to cover the $1 million cost to continue the free lunches for the rest of the calendar year. Later, we learned if Enfield applies to the state that they will receive the $1 million reimbursement. Great news. During our budget deliberations, someone asked if we could give the Enfield Public Schools $1 million less, million dollars less because of that reimbursement. That's all, no more, no less. When we deliberate on the budget, everything is on the table, all the departments. We throw out all kinds of scenarios. It doesn't mean it's gonna happen. Our goal as counselors is to be good stewards with taxpayers' money. We want the best for Enfield while being fiscally responsible. We are also keenly aware of how our decisions will affect the taxes. I would like to ask residents to keep in mind that we are only a phone call away. All of our numbers are listed on the town website. If you hear an idea, or perhaps it's a rumor, please call one of us. I have regular residents who call me frequently to see if something is a fact or a rumor. So that being said, we support the Enfield Public Schools. Also another school point, um, as Nanta Community College just celebrated their 50th anniversary of being in Enfield. It's hard to believe it's been 50 years. Uh, they just recently had their graduation last week and it was held in Dunkin' Donuts Park in Hartford. And my family was actually invited to participate in the graduation. My husband, myself, our two sons, we all graduated from as Nuntuck, and it actually began our <clears throat> educational journey, and it's where I met my husband. So it was, uh, it, was, it, it was an honor for my family to be invited as an alumni to participate in their celebration and to be included in their graduation ceremony, and I'd like to congratulate all the, the graduates. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Pisner. Um, well, they both said what I was going to say about the school board budget, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, I voted the way I voted. Um, I voted against the budget. Um, and it was for a lot of what, Phil, I thank you for coming and for crunching those numbers. And I look forward to you continuing to come and crunch more numbers. Um, I agree when people get their tax bills. And I do think that we could have worked a little harder. And as I said at the last meeting, I think that budget was predetermined. We got it quickly. We didn't have enough of time to really digest it. Um, and I agree too that it should be more we look at this. I said last time a quarterly, we got one quarterly and then it just fell apart. So um, I stand by my vote. I, I, I've gotten some applause for it and I've gotten some recourse for it. Um, but I stand behind every vote that I make. Um, do we know when the books are going to be ready with the adopted 2024 budget in it? We don't. Okay. Um, so on a lighter note, I just want to congratulate all our seniors that will be, uh, they will be graduating before our next council meeting. So I just want to congratulate every single senior. They had a tough few years going through COVID. So I wish each and every one of our Enfield seniors the very best moving forward, no matter what they choose to do. Um, I think Enfield has a great school system and, and they will have a great start. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Ledwick. Hey, real quick, just I appreciate the mayor making a recommendation on the meeting. Just curious, is it going to be a special meeting or is it going to be before the next council meeting when the manager report? I don't know. 
Well, I think that's something that we could we could decide if it's a special meeting. We'll, we'll, we'll let everybody know. All right, cool. But okay. I would tend to say that I would like a special meeting. Perfect, right, and hopefully sooner than later. Correct. Yeah. And then, and I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but there, there's a mention, and I apologize if you were to give us an update, but about a meeting that you attended with the Jimmy's Pub and, and the resident. Just curious if you can give us a little bit of background when your manager report. I don't remember an update you may have given, and I apologize if you did. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, Councillor uh, Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A couple things. I, I think uh, in regard to the uh, Thomas Abbey statue uh, in front of the UCC church, I think for some time uh, it's been uh, agreed upon that the town would take care of it per a written agreement. I believe that's the case. I think that hasn't changed. So um, as to the residents of Francis and Highland, um, you know, I think this is, you know, we've heard a lot about this for good reason. Uh, I would I would really hate to have somebody urinating on my yard with some regularity. I think there are three parts to this problem. One is the rules that we have here that regard to this in regard to this behavior. There are existing public urination rules. There are existing noise ordinance rules. Uh, I think the rule that we should codify here is uh, only resident parking on Francis and Highland. I think that's clean. It's hard for us to continue to maybe try to mitigate um, or mediate uh, disputes between residents and the business. I think that's maybe a little bit beyond the scope of the town. What we can do is create a good common sense rule based on feedback that we've gotten uh, and then work to the second part, which is the enforcement of this rule. It's concerning to me if the, the police department is unfortunately giving tickets to actual residents who should be protected. I would love to the through the uh, mayor to the town manager uh, more of an understanding. Maybe they didn't get the stickers on there. Maybe there's some confusion. If we could understand a little bit more. But I think primarily the enforcement prong of this is what needs some help. So we're giving the tickets. Are they being received? Are people paying them? Or is the business owner paying them for residents, as was discussed at a prior meeting? Um, and the last one is just tinkering with these rules after the fact. But I think for now, uh, in the near future, we should codify that as a permanent rule on Francis and Highland. This isn't done lightly. We've heard many, many, many reports with a lot of evidence regarding really bad behavior, littering, urination, all sorts of belligerence. So that's my two cents on that. I absolutely support doing a special meeting. Um, just to clarify, or uh, really a question to Councillor Nelson, because it was his idea originally, I guess, here. Um, would this be uh, exercise of the Section 8 charter powers for investigation, you know, just to get more information from the assessor and from the committee that is the BAA, both are subject to that Section 8? Is that how you're thinking about it? <laughs> I, I apologize. A uh, lot, lot of long night. Um, would we be speaking to both the assessor and the BAA uh, pursuant to investigation to understand more of these issues? So under no. my communications, I will address that. Okay, and just for, for my mind, I, I appreciate that, uh, Councillor Nelson. Uh, I would support doing both just because there are, I think, some questions remaining from the report itself for both. Thank you. Councillor Nelson. Okay, first, um, I would like the meeting that we have with the BAA, I would also like the assessor there. I sat in on a meeting with the BAA and the assessor. Uh, Representative Hall was uh, in attendance with me. We discussed, I believe, five different issues. And I'm pretty sure out of the five, they were able to resolve four of them because they sat at the table and they talked back and forth why they had their opinion, why he had his opinion, and they came to a resolution because they understood where each other were coming from. I believe they both should be put in the room. Let's get to the bottom of it. If it's a knockdown, drag out fight, so be it. They either work together or then we really have a tough decision on all of them because the taxpayers are losing here and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So until we can get to the bottom of it and we're not gonna get to the bottom of it because we're gonna have the same thing we have with this report. They said this, they said this. Unless they're sitting in the room where we can say, what's your stance, what's your stance and get to the bottom of it. Maybe we'll find out who the problem is, which side the problem is. But that's, that's exactly what I want to do. I want them both in the room together with us. Otherwise, I think we're wasting our time. Um, uh, through the mayor to the town manager, I just want to um, go on record uh, that you say that the court will be started for Wallop School uh, Park in August. 
the basketball court? That is the schedule provided to me by Public Works based on their consultation with the available vendors. Okay, thank you. And then also through the mayor to the town manager, were we able to get DPW out to the corner of Mullen Road and Steel Road uh, and Louise Drive and Post Office for sightline issues? Because they're every day it's getting worse and worse as the bushes are filling in and getting bigger. That was actually referred to Rick Rochelle for sightline issues, which falls under zoning. And yes, he went out there. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> As far as Francis Avenue and Jimmy's Pub, um, I, I'm not going to get too much into it other than I actually forwarded the videos myself to the owner's, owner of Jimmy's Pub um, because his daughter said she had never seen the video, so I made sure that he received them himself. Um, I'm not sure why she didn't get a copy of them, but I, I have it on my phone. I just checked. Um, I would support at this point because I saw the videos and tonight I actually or a couple days ago I requested through the t uh, mayor um, I asked the town manager and the chief of police if we could post those videos on the big TV tonight so people can see exactly what you deal with instead of just hearing the same people talk about the same things they could see what you're living with every day and maybe identify these people who are doing this, it's absurd, it's wrong, and I would never tolerate it in my front yard, and neither would anybody who is at Jimmy's Pub when they're sober. So since Highland Park has no problem with parking, at this point, I would say we go forward, and it's a 50-50 compromise. Resident parking, all others will be towed on Francis Avenue and leave Highland Park wide open. That's the way they want it. I'm good with that. But I agree with you, Councilman Hopkins. We can't keep doing this every meeting. It's going to get violent. We've seen they've left here, gone back, and in the streets, the police are called. It was almost a riot. It's got to stop. And, and it's very simple. I agree. They're two totally different streets. One's multifamily, one's single family residence. What's the harm in making it resident parking only? All others will be towed because the new parking fines are just as much a joke as the old ones. $20, a fat guy like me, I'll pay a $20 fine so I don't have to walk down the street. But if you're going to tow my truck, that's a different story. And that has some teeth in it. But I think we need to act on this and we need to act on it soon before the uh, parking ban um, comes to an end. I'm sorry, I tried to play the middle, but at this point, nothing's happening other than us getting videos, and it seems to be getting worse. These people have zero respect for the neighbors over there, and it's got to stop. Um, Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Desperate. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have to speak, uh, uh, I want to speak on the budget as well, because I don't want anyone to be confused. We spent hours and hours and hours debating the budget. The sticking point, after many, many, many bipartisan cuts, the sticking point was $1.4 million to the Board of Education. That's just the fact. See, people can spin it however they want, but that is the fact of the matter, plain and simple. And I'll let the public decide what they think about votes against that. But for me personally, I would never vote to deprive our schools, our teachers, our kids, our families, the funding they need. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Councilor Despert. Is there anybody else? I, I just have a couple of, uh, of announcements to, uh, to make. First of all, um, last week we had Coming, coming through town, we had the Connecticut Special Olympics torch run. Uh, our Enfield Police Department and Shaker Pines Fire Department leading the way. Uh, Special Olympics athletes from Allied, uh, the Allied Stars team uh, carried the flag and torch. Uh, There's a few of us that were in attendance, and it was a, a, a great event. Um, I actually ended up running part of the part of the leg and. Uh, it was it was it was a good good event. Um, also, this past weekend, uh, our Allied Stars um, performed well at Fairfield University. Uh, 
These athletes, there's nothing stopping them. They don't care if they win. They don't care if they lose. They don't care if they get a medal. But they're out there. They they and they're out there competing. So, uh, congratulations to all the athletes uh, from Enfield Stars and their performance this past weekend. Uh, Phil, if you ever get a chance, you should uh, go to one of those events. Bring your camera. I'll I'll invite you. And then and then we can talk figures along the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention, uh, if some of you want to get your jot some of these dates down, because there's a lot of events that are that are happening, and I just want to let everybody know um, some of these dates. Um, I know that over at the high schools, uh, uh, June 6th and June 7th, tomorrow and Wednesday, the North Central Chamber of Commerce uh, they do their Acts of Kindness awards. Um, Tomorrow's at Enfield High School, and then the following day's at JFK. So if you have an opportunity, if any of us have an opportunity to attend, I think it would be a good good idea, especially coming at the end of school. We do have June 16th, our high school graduation. And once again, uh, congratulations to all the uh, seniors that are uh, going to be graduating. Uh, this Thursday, uh, June 8th, uh, the, at the Annex, the Enfield Adult Education Graduation Ceremony. Uh, this year, there's over 30 uh, adults getting their high school diploma, and I think that's wonderful. It, it, I think this year, of, of all the years that they've been doing this, it's one of the highest uh, graduation rates that they've had in quite some time. Also, uh, on June 7th, this Wednesday, is the 20th anniversary of the Senior Center. They're having a, a dinner there. Uh, go, go out and attend. Uh, also, that same night, Kite is having a meeting at, as Nuntuck. Leanne Bolio is uh, their farewell to her. She is retiring from her position from Kite, and they're having a ceremony uh, also. Uh, s Saturday, June 10th. Um, and Phil Loaves and Fishes, 40th anniversary gala at Grassmere Country Club. I have to make these announcements because they're, all these organizations are important to our community. So if you're thinking that I'm rattling off quite a bit of things here, well, there's a lot of events that are taking place. I'd like to see some of you in attendance that I haven't seen before. Uh, also, this past Saturday night was the first annual Mayor's Cup uh, softball game, which was held between the Enfield Police Department and the uh, the fire departments. They battled each other out Friday night, and uh, they had one heck of a he heck of a good time. The police department ended up winning, and uh, they won a rematch. And it looks like it's going to be sometime in September. Uh, but they did uh, hold a. Uh, actually, they made me go. Or they didn't make me, but. Um, I went around and asked for donations for the food shelf and for the um, uh, loaves and fishes. And lo, lo and behold, we collected close to $300 uh, with the people that were in attendance, and I thought that was fantastic. So for the people that were in attendance, and I see a few familiar faces here at the crowd tonight, um, thank you for your donations because it, it was a fun night. Um, so for Officer Pelletier, Sergeant Pelletier, and uh, Musi for the, you know, taking charge of this event, um, you know, maybe next year we get more people uh, involved. Also coming up the 14th, we have the Grandparents Family uh, Art Night, uh, which is a good thing. It's grandparents raising grandchildren. Go on out and support it. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention uh, June 17th. Um, on the green, there's the Juneteenth uh, event on the town green, and then also there is another Pride Festival at the Congregational Church on Route 5. So uh, those are a few things that I did want to mention. Uh, I know that's a lot of events there, and uh, hopefully uh, we get people uh, to go. Uh, for the people... Um, that were here tonight in regard to, uh, you know, Highland and Francis. Well, Francis uh, Avenue, you know, the parking, you know, it's a situation that I think that we're going to have to uh, 
address before you know the parking violation uh, thing runs out. Uh, so we we will uh, address that, and hopefully it, uh, we'll discuss that in, in this week coming up. All right, amongst us. Uh, the other thing is uh, getting that that meeting together um, with the BAA. Uh, we'll we'll move forward on that and set a date with that. Um, so and we'll, we will discuss amongst leadership um, who will be in attendance. Okay, and I think that that's fair. Okay, so we will uh, move forward with that. So. Next, on to the town manager report. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm going to go rapid fire through some of the things based on the time tonight. Uh, the first issue is uh, the report on the band shell. It is being shipped or delivered on June 14th, not sure which, and we are actually constructing the band shell and then pouring the concrete after to ensure that it's not going to crack once the machines are over it. So. Uh, the first two concerts, the first which starts, the first one is next, a week from tomorrow, um, will be using a mobile stage. And then we will be able to use the band shell after that. We've uh, contracted with 10 bands, and we have um, sound being provided for all of them. And included in that is um, a battle of the bands that we're hoping to get some local talent uh, for one of the dates in July. Um, in terms of towing, we do not have a, a town-wide policy on towing that only happens in terms of dangerous situations or a snow emergency. So there is no opportunity for us to just determine to tow vehicles. That's, that's not how it works. So if we wanted to talk about modifying the um, current regulations and signs, you do have until the end of July to do so. Whether you choose to refer it to a committee or just act as a committee of the whole, that would be the option about keeping or removing the signs and designating it um, otherwise. Uh, there, in your packets tonight that you received downstairs, there's a couple of items. The first is the report on the tax sale that occurred on May 25th, which resulted in an additional 600000 uh, coming in from that sale. And there were actually two properties that came in prior to the uh, sale that cleared their bills in advance. So the number is actually higher than that. So I've included that in your packet. I've also included the latest draft of the tax assistance agreement proposal for uh, Fast Track Realty for the uh, redevelopment of the Mass Mutual site. We have gotten through the majority of the language. I would like to draw your attention to Section 8, the assignment section. Uh, there is still some work that needs to be done there, and we should probably talk about that in leadership and or um, before the next meeting. They would like to have that executed at the June 19th meeting. So I would like to be able to offer a draft for the public to look at as well as have a final copy to you so that there can be discussion. But that was in the packet as well. There is um, big news happening with the South River bridge replacement. Uh, the bridge is going to probably officially close on Monday, next Monday the 16th. This is important to communicate out to the public because the only access to South River Street starting at that point is going to be via the Asnuntuck Bridge, underneath the bridge. There will be no parking on either side of Asnuntuck for the duration of this project in order to facilitate safety as well as truck traffic. Uh, the neighbors of South River Street have all been notified multiple times since last year about what's happening. Uh, there is an emergency plan in place. There is a public works plan in place because we can't get some of the trucks down there. Uh, and they've been advised to fill their oil tanks and everything that needs to be done. Uh, the latest communication from the engineering department went out last week, so everybody should be up to date with, with what's happening. The bridge was originally scheduled to close on the 1st, but there was some issues with some of the Rothic construction uh, beams, and so we had to wait for that. So it does look like Monday is going to be the day. The duration of that project is still slated for four months. <clears throat> for the budget, I just want to make one comment for everyone to just to keep in perspective that over 90% of the budget that you were given to look at and review is encumbered with contractual rental and lease obligations. So the amount of scope that you have was really um, the majority of it is for capital 
uh, it's for you know certain positions and things that you have jurisdiction over, and, and you did make some pretty significant cuts. At the end of the day, there were six positions removed from the budget, um, and there was a lot cut from the capital. So I think in general, we just need to keep in mind that there's not a lot of wiggle room on the budget that is presented to you. In terms of open space, I do just want to clarify for everybody, because this is coming up, there is a resolution, but if you read the recommendation, uh, what I'm asking you to do, and I included the relevant 490 handbook open space classification pages, is that you now have to set parameters. So what's happened if you look in the packet, you've received the memo back from the Planning and Zoning Commission that has done the work based on the referral that you made to them last fall. The plan of conservation and development was adopted and formally submitted to the state at the end of May. So now the work starts in terms of you adopting the PA 490 open space ordinance, which is different than farmland, which is different than forestry. So what has to happen is you have to click off what you want included, the sizes, contiguous. Um, do you want to exclude, um, for example, uh, watershed property, um, all of these things. And my recommendation is that you ask the Conservation Commission, who has the expertise in this area, who has also been advocating for this, to actually do the draft. Let them do the work, have two liaisons, work with them from the council, and then have it come back here for you to review, reflect upon, make changes to, and then adopt. You have a lot on your plate, and so I thought that this was one way in order to kind of keep all the wheels moving. This really needs to be on the books, adopted formally, and in effect before the grand list is signed on October 1st. So there's not a lot of time if we want everybody to be able to take advantage of the open space ordinance. So that was kind of the purpose of the resolution as it's currently written. And the last thing, um, in terms of Jimmy's Pub, I do check in regularly on that situation. The, the meeting that I think, Councilor Ludwig, that was referenced was the last one was right around Easter, early April. And we tried to, you know, in various ways, talk things out. Um, there were some small successes, but I think that a sustained effort is just not going to work um, in terms of the two sides, and that's unfortunate. So I will look forward to the direction of the council as to what's going to happen from there. And the last thing I'd like to do is just um, ask the indulgence of the council, because it is going on to be a late night, if you wouldn't mind bringing up agenda item J, which is the very simple item of a resolution waiving the bid requirements for the fiscal year 22-23 audit, which you do every year, which would allow Mr. Wilcox to go home a little earlier. So moved. So moved. Okay, Councillor Hopkins and a second by Councillor Finger. <clears throat> the resolution now, therefore, it be resolved that in accordance with Chapter 5, Section 8, Paragraph D of the Enfield Town Charter, the Enfield Town Council does hereby determine that it is against the best interests of the town to require competitive bidding for the fiscal year 2022-2023 audit, date prepared May 17, 2023, prepared by John A. Wilcox, CBA Director of Finance. So moved. Councillor Nelson and a second by Deputy Mayor Sakala. Any discussion on this? Roll call, please. Councillor Finger? Um, four. Councillor Hopkins? Four. Councillor Ludwig? Four. Councillor Mangini? Four. Councillor Nelson? Four. Councillor Pisner? Four. Councillor Santanella? Four. Councillor Ungeyer? Four. four. Deputy Mayor Sakala? Four. Mayor Crisati? Four. And Councilor Despard? Four. Eleven in favor, none against. Okay, item 10, are there any uh, reports from special committees of the council? Oh, he's, I don't um, she's oh okay. We, okay. So just before okay, we wrap ahead. up my section, um, Steve has an item on the agenda, so you'll be hearing from him. But under the town attorney's report, Attorney Coppola is still here. If there was any opportunities that any of you wanted to ask follow-up questions, I could do that under my report before we move on. Or have him rebut any of the issues that were raised, unless you want to defer that. We'll discuss it. At the we'll, dis we'll, we'll defer. We'll discuss it. But we're all set. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you. Don't forget your pink bunny slippers, John.
Okay. Uh, is there a town attorney report? No. Okay, we're okay. We're good. Steve, you have, um, an, or, or you'll wait until we get to that item. Okay, thank you. Uh, report of special committees. There are none. There's uh, unfinished business. There are none. We're going to go to item 12 under the consent agenda. Uh, there are seven items on the consent agenda tonight. Uh, does anyone want to remove any of the items for discussion? I just need one. I mean, I just have a question on the Alcorn. I don't know if you need to do all three, but that's the only one. I just had a question. It's, it's just a question? Yeah, because I just want to make sure I clarify something before I vote. That's all. All right. Um, I'll allow the question. Go ahead. You can state so the question. This was part of the refer please part of the referendum. I so I know certain buildings qualified for seventy percent reimbursement. I see thirty five here. Just okay. I want to make sure just publicly, this wasn't one. Even though it's used, it's not used for a school, but it's used by school administration. And so, why didn't it apply? Why wouldn't a seventy percent reimbursement apply for the referendum? Is what and if because it's a town. I mean, just want to make sure I'm not against it, but I, what, if the rest of them pass, is and the other thing, has the work been started yet too? Sorry, I know I'm not asking. It's okay. But I, I, if it doesn't qualify for the 70, I guess why? It doesn't qualify for the 70 because it doesn't have children K through 12 within. So it had been slated to receive, to receive zero reimbursement. Okay, so zero, okay. So now we're back up based on the work of our public works deputy director. We are back up to 35, zero, which 35, is perfect. why you're now yep. seeing these three per motions. Th thank you, that was the answer I want to make sure we were getting. <laughs> and we are only in design phase. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, Councilor <clears throat> Nelson and a second by Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, all in favor? Unanimous. Okay, next uh, appointment, town council appointed. Uh, the first one is the Enfield Culture and Arts Commission, the term of office of Donna Hamry. Uh, expires 6-1-23. Reappointment would be until 6-1-2025. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Yeah, second. Councillor uh, Nelson and a second by uh, Councillor Ungeyer. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Uh, it's unanimous. 11-0. Uh, number two, North Central Health Department Board of Directors. Uh, Enfield representative, term of office of James Hoy expires 6-30-23. Reappointment would be until 6-30-2026. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Councilor Hopkins and a second by Councilor Mangini. Um, all, any discussion? All in favor? Uh, unanimous. 11-0. Okay. On to the regular agenda items. Uh, the first item is a section 8-24 referral uh, of the town-owned parcels to the Planning and Zoning Commission in your folders. Um, uh, has the reduction of the units as well as the rents and what the rents would be. Um, and I know that we received them earlier uh, today or last week, I think we received them. Okay, so... Discussion resolution. The resolution referring. <clears throat> Excuse me, one second. I thought he just said fair rights. Okay. This is the resolution referring the proposed conveyance of town owned parcels known as the Strand Lamagna parcels to the Planning and Zoning Commission per Connecticut General Statute 8 24 and setting a public hearing. Be it resolved that the proposed conveyance of the above reference town-owned parcels is hereby referred to the Planning and Zoning Commission in conformance with the requirements of the Gen uh, Connecticut General State Statute 8-24. Be it further resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby authorize setting a public hearing in accordance with the requirements of the Connecticut General Statute 7-163E on June 19, 2023 at 6.55 in the Council Chambers, date prepared May 30th, 2023, prepared by the Office of Economic and Community Development. So moved. Councilor Mangini. Second. And a second by Deputy Mayor Sakala. 
Um, so uh, discussion, I'm going to throw it over to the town manager just for a minute, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Okay, basically I also want to point out that Nelson Tereso, our economic development director, is zooming in for this agenda item and is available for conversation as well. Uh, but basically what we want to put in front of you is the fact that IRD, at your request, has scaled down the project significantly and has incorporated all of this additional on-site parking, which was attached in your Manila folders today. So their previous plan was a two-phased build-out with three buildings that consisted of 123 housing units and 1,771 square feet of first-floor commercial space on North Main Street, which is required in the TD5 zone. Um, they had 56 parking spaces in that previous iteration, which did not meet with any of your approval. This modified plan is now a single phase project with two buildings consisting of 70 units and 1,720 square feet commercial space on North Main Street and 76 parking spaces. So they now have over a one-to-one -one ratio on parking on the property for the units. So just as a reminder that this is a 20 plus million dollar investment in Thompsonville on a very small parcel of land. It's new construction and this is still a development at risk for the developer because unless they get awarded the extremely competitive grant that they're going for from Chaffa, this will not move forward. And that process happens from the fall into the early winter. So you at this point are at no risk of simply doing a referral as required by state law concerning a conveyance. I also want to remind you that you are insistent upon talking to the IRD people directly about what your vision is for Thompsonville. So Nelson has invited Jessica Mullins, who's one of the higher up executives with IRD, to come to your June 19th meeting. And the conversations, concerns, and the vision that you have about Thompsonville would be best directed to her at that meeting concerning what this project looks like. I don't know, Nelson, did I forget anything? I think you stole all my thunder. Um, yeah, as Ellen mentioned, um, we're at a point now where this starts the conveyance process, and um, June 19th would be the time where IRD would be coming in. Uh, Jessica Mullins, the vice president of Impact Residential Development, to discuss and negotiate a purchase and sales agreement with the town based on this modified site plan. Now, if this site plan, this development plan, does not meet the town council's vision for the uh, for the for the property. Um, as we solicited the RFP, RFQ, and they submitted their original proposal, then it's up to uh, ultimately negotiation between the town and the developer. So this just starts the process for the conveyance. Okay, thank you, Nelson. Uh, Councillor Nelson, and then Councillor Pizzi. Uh Okay, I cannot support moving forward on this because this does not meet the RFP that was put out. Um, you could say it has, you know, 1,700 square feet of commercial space, but it's only their in-house offices. There is no commercial whatsoever that is open to the public for this. Um, my next co um, concern is um, what percent of this is actually being funded by the developers versus taxpayers? Because they're going for all kinds of grants and stuff like that to make this possible. Um, so the taxpayers end up footing the bill for this entire project. That's my first question. And then my next question is, how does this help the redevelopment of Thompsonville? With the current buildings that are scheduled to be torn down and the future of the train station um, still in limbo, a lot of things can change in Thompsonville. And at this point, with this particular project, I'd rather see us put more of the um, uh, town gardens um, there for now. Wait, let Thompsonville go through its changes with the teardowns and the train station coming in and see if we can attract another developer because, you know, I was told this is the only developer that applied. Um, that doesn't mean we have to take it. And 70 units of affordable housing is just not a benefit for Enfield. Several council members sitting here, and I'm not gonna point them out, have said, Enfield's getting poorer. How does this help change that? It doesn't. So I cannot support moving forward on this. Thank you. Councilor Pizner, then. 
Uh, this is, again, not what was presented originally. There's no retail on the bottom. There's no storefronts. It's not what we agreed to. So, and the only reason I said yes the last time was it was just because you needed a yes so that they could go for the grant. They came back, I still don't think they're listening to us. So I agree 100% with Councillor Nelson. This is not my vision for Thompsonville, um, and I'm not supporting it. Uh, Councillor Despard, then Councillor Hopkins. Uh, so, so this is a, a $20 million investment into Thompsonville. We've been talking for years, previous councils, you know, we want, we got to reinvest in Thompsonville. We need, we need to really make that commitment to invest in Thompsonville. Here's a $20 million investment from a world-class developer. So it doesn't have your, 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 your little bake shop that you wanted underneath. Like it, it's crazy. And affordable housing does not mean poor, Councillor Nelson. It does not mean poor. Today, in today's day and age, your average kid coming out of college can't afford a house. It's just, it doesn't happen that way anymore. The economy's not that way, right? It's not a good economy. You come out of, out of college, you can have two incomes and you're not affording a house. You've got to rent, you've got to find somewhere to go. So do we want young professionals here in Enfield, in Thompsonville? Yes, I do. So sign me up for this. Uh, it, it's it would be, uh, uh, it's gonna be a massive mistake if we let this go. Uh, voting against affordable housing, affordable meaning young professional families would just be crazy for this council to, to, to vote against. So that's it for me. Councillor Hopkins. Th thank you, Ms. Bear. I, I uh, agree on two grounds. One, economic. Uh, I agree with Councillor Despard, some of his points. Folks who are living here in our community are spending money in our community. They don't do it exclusively, but they absolutely will at local businesses. And that's something we absolutely want. We cannot, unfortunately, choose, uh, decide to be too choosy. We should uh, impart um, some particular conditions, one of which, which was discussed before, is the parking situation. I think a number of councillors raised that. Uh, I myself did. Uh, I think they've been responsive and have come back with that. Now I think the town might also need to consider uh, you know, maybe meters in that part of town going forward. I would love to, to know if the uh, planning and zoning uh, has a, an opinion on that. But this is a lot of potential new people in town. Um, I wish we had a system where we could set our own um, sales tax in town. We don't. Uh, but we do have a system where we are jockeying for state money. Uh, jockeying for the taxpayers money from other parts of Connecticut. It's kind of a doggy -e dog system, but we are getting some of that through this investment uh, from this developer. It's taxpayer money for sure, but I would uh, much prefer it to be spent here versus somewhere else. Community gardens are not particularly compelling for the economic uh, 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 part. Um, second ground here is a moral one. We need housing in infield so that people can afford housing in infield. If we don't build more housing, rents will only increase. It's a small state. People are commuting to other parts of the state. We are a more affordable part of the state, but those numbers are only going to go up. Uh, that's a ground that I think is important morally, but it also helps economically because if people move here because it's a relatively reasonable cost of living, uh, we're going to get more people in our community spending their money. I, for one, came to Enfield, the reason why my wife and I decided to do so, because the rent was lower than a lot of other places. My, job, my wife got a job at Springfield College, uh, and I wanted to work on the public defender system. But do we want to attract people? We have to open these opportunities. Do we want to grow the town? We have to open these opportunities. So I support this. Uh, I do think it was, it was nice that they uh, listened to some of our concern and feedback, and I think it's appropriate that we raise those things, because uh, it's not just a, everything goes. We have restrictions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Santanella? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we ripped down a treasured building, right, and a, a love theater, right? We would have preferred to have left them there, but the promise was we were going to do that to get development into the community. And I don't think anybody thought that gardens was the, the development. Um, I, I can't, I just don't understand how we can not think that this is the right direction. I'm not happy that there's no retail, right? And we have this concern about parking. We had a great conversation after the last meeting about parking issues. Let's say there's a coffee shop and a beauty salon and you know some other small business there. We're talking 15 cars that would 
pay for the patrons for those buildings. We're not talking about hundreds of cars unless you're thinking a restaurant, then you are talking about hundreds of cars. So I'm not sure that the parking piece is as valid anymore because I think they've solved the majority of the parking issue with what they've done to accommodate the residents that are there. Frankly, I think if there's a void for retail, I think there's plenty of other opportunities for retail development in and along that area that the private sector will start to see the development opportunity when they know that they've got 75 units of people who have no coffee shop. Well, that's an entrepreneurial opportunity for somebody to go and find a spot. And there are spots there. So I, I just think it's a little short-sighted that it's not perfect. I, I think it creates the right opportunity, which was the intention when we ripped down those buildings. And I think for us to sit here now and honestly only say that what we're going to deliver is something less is I, I think we're letting people down who we gave a promise to. So, and, and I think we have a substantial investor, a substantial amount of money, and there is no risk because the, the grant money is not a guarantee. And I think we need to keep the process going. So I'm going to vote in favor. Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala, then Ms. Mangini. Thank you. Um, I am in favor of this. So this town and this council and the councils before us and the councils before us in the last 10 or 15 years have been marching towards redevelopment of Thompsonville at a slower than snail's pace. And now that we have finally gotten close to having people who are here and willing to invest in downtown Thompsonville, we wanna pump the brakes, turn around, and hightail it out of there. It is absolutely alarming. And to be quite frank, it's embarrassing that we have had our staff and, our, and we've asked them to go back and modify what they've given us because of the concerns with the parking and the concerns with it being too large. This company did it, they came back, Nelson did a lot of work, came back and we're gonna vote no again? What a colossal waste of everybody's time. Um, yes, we would love to have more commercial property down there, but let's be honest, you guys all say you've been down to Thompsonville. How many commercial storefronts are down there that are vacant? There's a ton. So like John said, if somebody wants to open up a coffee shop, cigar bar, a nail salon, a novelty shop, there is plenty of opportunity for that to come. And once they start this property, I think those things will follow. Matt hit it on the, na the nail on the head. Affordable housing doesn't mean necessarily low income or Section 8. That is a very bad stigma to have and to spread. It is affordable housing. Um, again, we have been begging for this type of redevelopment. It's here. I'm glad they're here, and I will be supporting it. Um, I hope people just really take a minute reflect on what we've been trying to do down in Thompsonville and understand this is a step in the right direction. Okay, thank you, Councilor Mangini. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not gonna repeat what everybody said, but what we must remember also is that affordable housing is the law of the land. It's coming down the pike, and we here in Enfield need to be prepared and proactive in the, um, uh, you know, findings of affordable affordable housing. Um, I think Matt <clears throat> said it very nicely that um, in many cases, people um, can't afford rent, can't afford a mortgage. So we need to closely look at the situation. And what I'm seeing here, again, the people did go back to the drawing board. There's no parking um, concern, or if there was, they've corrected it or they've modified it. And <clears throat> at this point, um, given the fact that Chaffa has a program that will um, assist with this affordable housing um, situation, I most definitely will be supporting this resolution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a couple of comments here. I, I am in definite support. I've been in support of uh, this project since it was 
since we've been talking about it. Uh, the thing that that we had asked uh, Impact to do uh, was to modify this project from 123 units down to seven, 70 units. Affordable housing. This is what we need down in this particular area. Uh, once again, I, I will state that when we talk about young professionals coming in, this is the type of housing that young professionals come in. This is what they want. This is what they need, They're seeing something new. I am in total uh, support of this project. I firmly believe that, uh, you know, we do have some, some uh, units. We have a beauty salon down there. We have a, a health uh, store that's going to be opening up <coughs> soon. Uh, the Salas properties down there. I still think that once this project uh, is up and running, that you're going to get these small little shops that are going to be popping up left and right. Um, so once again, uh, this is a, a perfect opportunity for, and everybody's seen the tiered income. All right, this is not low income Section 8 housing, and to hear that being spread is pretty alarming to me. Um, you know, as Councillor Santanella did say, you know, we, we took down buildings. We, we have a vision. And then all of a sudden, some of us were, were getting cold feet. And, and that, that's like almost like a, a typical thing that happens here. We, we cannot do that. We got to move forward with these projects. You have South River Street Bridge being done. You have the train station commitment that, that is being done. We took those buildings down because nobody had the nerve to do it. We did it. And now we have the opportunity for a nice housing, affordable housing complex for young professionals coming into this town who would want to come into this town. Uh, once again, I am all in favor of it. Uh, Nelson, you did a great job uh, in communicating with impact and relaying the message through leadership because we wanted a scaled down project where the parking was going to be, uh, you know, problem solved. Problem was solved. The complex is now going to be a one phase development. They did what we asked. You know, you know, we, we don't have the, the mixed usage down there, but that should not stop the project from moving forward because we're looking at a $20 million investment. And this is what we're looking for. We're looking for making an investment to our town and to Thompsonville. I'm in favor of this. Councilor Fringer. It's funny. Uh, as in everything else, you want to add meters to down there, which is like a tax to people. You don't want businesses down there, and you guys talk about the empty buildings down there to bring businesses in. They've been empty for years. Years. And we don't see anybody going down there right now. And you say you want to put a big complex down there? You know something? You're right. Absolutely right. We should have a big complex down there that should attract businesses and should attract uh, people that come down here to live and live in a nice little place like that and, and then look at the pond and then look how the people walk around the pond and be careful down there. But your point is, and my point is, is that it's like, it's, it's like you just want to keep adding money to the taxpayers. This is the taxpayers' money. If this, if this business came up and said, we have the money to build this thing, I would say, perfect. But they're gonna, you're using taxpayers' money to, to help them. And, and uh, you know something? But you're right. We need to have something down there. So, you know, so I'm going to change my vote from no to yes. Only to prove a point to you, especially you, Mr. Big Man. Yeah, point your fingers to yourself, is that you're not always right. Thank you. I have one point. Councilor Ungar. I'll just make it quick. Um, you say affordable housing. Usually affordable housing is a third of your monthly income. So if someone makes $30,000, your rent's going to be under $1,000. And so here we're going down a slippery slope that it may attract people that make less money. And I'm concerned about what may happen there. 
and I don't think we should take the first thing that comes along. I'd be willing to wait, and like he said, have a garden there for another year and find something that really fits, that we really like. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Councillor Nelson. Everybody who supports this is saying it's a $20 million investment. This company's investing. This company's not investing. They're taking taxpayer dollars. They're building this, and, and I asked the question, and I haven't got the answer. What is the actual investment coming out of this company's pocket and not the taxpayer's pocket? So the taxpayers are going to fund to build it. The taxpayers paid to tear the buildings down. The taxpayers are going to subsidize the affordable rents when all the other taxpayers in Enfield just got hijacked a thousand dollars a year with this last budget we just passed well I, I mean your policies have done wonders for san francisco so let's bring it to enfield because that's what we want councillor santanella well i'm not on the town council in san francisco so i don't think i've done anything for san francisco and you know if you would rather the taxpayer dollars that are coming from the government to go to San Francisco to build a similar building to build a neighborhood in San Francisco, so be it. But we have an, uh, that money. That is the money that I was telling you that come, it's going to go somewhere. It's, and it's coming from the federal government and it's going to go somewhere. So why not Thompsonville? I, I agree with you on this tax print in principle, but the fact of the matter is we got to play the game. And if there's an opportunity for its investment, in that neighborhood, you know, why I, I just it's you're like cutting your nose off to spite your face and, and this insistence that it's poor people like I, I don't know if you know people who live in these kinds of buildings. First of all, they're beautiful and they're well maintained and generally they have college degrees and they're working a good job, but they have student loans and they have credit card debt and they have they can't afford a nice place to live. This makes them gives them a solid place to live and and not have to be house poor. You know, I, I am sympathetic to your concerns, but this money is going to go somewhere and we have a neighborhood that is in need of improvement and quite honestly, not improving that neighborhood costs everybody else money. 60% of our police activity is in Thompsonville. 60% of our EMS services is in Thompsonville. I mean, it is an expensive neighborhood to maintain as it is. And unless we change the economic makeup somehow, we're just, we're just gonna let, be left with more of the same. A very expensive neighborhood that everybody else is having to help maintain. So, I. You know, I, I, yeah, I don't have anything else. Sorry. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you. 60% of the population's in Thompsonville, too. And also, I've asked this question and I have not received any documentation on it. Is this a tax exempt property? No, I don't believe so. Oh, you don't believe so? Not one person here has documentation showing that they're paying taxes or fair taxes i've asked i'm, I'm going to phone a friend to nelson but i believe they right. are going to be a tax paying entity but nelson also has the number of what um ird is investing and it is a significant amount so the overall cost of the entire project is in the in the it's closer to 30 to 35 million 20 20 million is construction cost the developers on the hook for about two and a half to three million dollars of acquisition costs along with construction costs. Um, in regards to it being uh, tax exempt, it is not tax exempt. This is a for-profit and they're going to be paying taxes on the real estate and the personal property. Thank you, Nelson, for that information. Sheila, roll call. Councillor Finger. Four. Councillor Hopkins. Four. Councillor Ludwick. Against. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Nelson. Absolutely not. Councilor Pisner. No. Councilor Santanella. Four. Councilor Ungeyer. Against. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Mayor Crisati. Four. And Councilor Despard. Four. 
That's seven in favor, four against. Okay, item D. Uh, at our last town council meeting, uh, we had WPC and DPW crews working right outside over here on that sewer break. Uh, the next resolution is to transfer money to pay for the work associated with the repair and the bypass that was needed at Great Brook uh, Pump Station. The uh, item D, discussion resolution, is a request for a transfer of funds for the emergency repairs of Great Brook, Force Main, and rising utility costs. Be it resolved that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfer hereby is made from Water Pollution Control. Um, we have the salaries, 175000 construction-related services, 23000 technical service, 5000 to Water Pollution Control Construction Services, 203000 From Water Pollution Control Health Medical Insurance, 80000 to Water Pollution Control Electricity, 80000 From the Water Pollution Control Health Medical Insurance, 13000 Social Security, 7000 to water pollution control, water sewerage, 20,000, date prepared June 1, 2023, prepared by Donald Nunes, Public Works Director. So moved. Councilor second. Mangini and a second by Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, discussion will start with Councilor Hopkins. Right thank you. Just briefly, I wanted, I wanted to again thank all the town employees that went to work on this. It really sucks when this stuff happens, but um, folks sprang into action to fix it. I think it's another example about why we really need to make sure we're maintaining our infrastructure, why there's a plan for it. These things happen. We need to plan plan for it in the budget. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mangini. Thank you. I'm just um, <clears throat> for clarification, um, through our Mayor to our town manager, there's no budget impact, no budgetary impact, but there are transfers. Are we going to um, adversely affect from where the money is being transferred from to? And obviously, we do, uh, you know, need to cover the three hundred and three thousand dollars. But I just, I just wondered if we're going to be hurting the pot because there's no impact. So the, the pot that's being hurt is the surplus that goes back into oh. the um, WPC fund and or any equipment sinking funds, which we would normally have funded with end of year fiscal surplus. Okay, thank you. Okay, Sheila, we'll, we'll uh, oh, excuse me, Can, Can Nelson. Councilor Nelson. Huh? I, I'm good. Yeah, so Councilor Nelson. Okay, go ahead. This is on top of the 200000 we transferred in two weeks ago? I think what we transferred in was for something else. No, that was for emergency repair for the Great Brook Force Main that they were digging up while we sat here. Then probably. So it's a total of 503000 And it may grow because we had some things on state contract in order to do the bypass at Great Brook for the over 18 hours that we had to do that. If you, you recall the, all the trucks that were lined up and backing up where the hoses would be exchanged. Right. I, I guess my concern is I don't like that getting washed in with a bunch of other transfers. That should be a standalone item itself so we know what the cost was. I can do a chart for you once all the costs are known so that you have it all in one place, like what we did with the tax sale tonight so that you see everything at a glance. But just keep in mind that this is something that could possibly be a regular occurrence. There was no known regular maintenance on any of our sanitary sewer lines up until five years ago. This one could very much collapse tomorrow because we don't know what happens on either end of it. So all we did was repair the section that's in the intersection. Going north and south off of that main line, I don't know what's there. Councilor Santanella. Yeah. Um, I just was like to clarify. So the start of the force main is at the American Legion, correct? Behind Great, there? That's Great Brook. Great Brook. Okay. And it goes all the way up Route 5 to High Street, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And it cost us potentially $500,000 to fix what I think was a six foot section yes. of that force main. Mm -hmm. And the materials that the remaining force main is made of is the same, There's, it's the same pipe. Correct. Right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're all set now. 
Roll call, please. Councilor Finger? Four. Councilor Hopkins? Four. Councilor Ludwig? Four. Councilor Mangini? Four. Councilor Nelson? Four. Councilor Pisner? Four. Councilor Santanella? Four. Councilor Ungayer? Deputy Mayor Sakala? Four. Mayor Crisati? Four. And Councilor Despard? Four. Eleven in favor, none against. Item E, discussion, resolution, a resolution referring the proposed improvements to the Department of Public Works at 40 Moody Road to the Planning and Zoning Commission per Connecticut General Statute 8-24. The resolution now therefore be resolved that the proposed improvements to the Department of Public Works, including the construction of above ground fuel tanks, fuel islands, canopy, access road and removal of existing underground storage tanks are hereby referred to the Planning and Zoning Commission in conformance with the requirements of Connecticut General Statute 8-24, respectfully submitted Donald T. Nunes, Director of Public Works. So moved. Councilor Mangini. Second. And a second by Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, discussion, uh, Councilor Pisner. Okay, so I'm, I wish there was a plan attached to this so we could see exactly what was happening. But also, it was my understanding that this was going to be part of the the safety academy redo when we connected everything am I, am I, uh, it is a separate project that's been funded on the capital schedule but you are correct in that if the public safety complex comes to fruition there is a plan to connect the two facilities on that back parcel that a, a town council purchased i guess a couple years ago mm -hmm. okay so but we don't have any kind of a plan as far as what exactly we're doing it's a fuel tank they're putting in. The uh, the below ground tanks are being taken out. The will be now will now have above ground tanks. There'll be a canopy and it'll be a better access because if you're familiar with that area, it's very tight in and out. So, from what I understand, they're bumping it out into that grassy area that is there. I, help me out, Councillor Finger. That's kind of what, it's where what it's talked going, about right? a couple of years. Right. Yeah. yeah. When, when, when the referendum last time yeah. didn't pass, but it's going to be bumped out and the roads going to be put in. It's going to be a, a, supposedly a better access one way in, one way out. And it's a little safer and, and enough for the trucks instead of them lining up, you know, six trucks deep that don't have an issue anymore. I can see if there's an initial design and circulate it to the town council. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you. Briefly, um, there's also an environmental and regulatory components to this. Um, the tanks are old. I believe there's some discussion previously about if, you know, they were to break, we would obviously be not in compliance with state rules and could incur penalties. I think it makes sense to get it out from both perspectives. Okay. Thank you. Be, Councillor Ludwig. Yeah, I, I've been for this, but again, it, it's like it's hard to make a referral of planning and zoning when we don't even know a schematic. And and I get point. I understand you don't need a schematic to pull the tank. We've been doing this for years. But again, the canopy access road. How do they? I guess I, I said, Don. How do they re approve something if they don't have a? Will they have a drawing? Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah, I think they 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 started. Yeah. Nice to have a schematic on some of these referrals, so I can at least have an idea what we're referring. Okay, thank you. Um, Sheila, roll call. Councilor Finger. Uh, I'm not sure where this is going to fit for me, but I'll, I'm, I'll, I will be upstanding from this vote because it's my area. Okay. I, I don't know. Councilor Hopkins. Four. Councilor Ludwig. Against. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Nelson. Against. Uh, Councilor Pisner. Four. Councilor Santanella. Four. Councilor Ungayer. Against. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Uh, Mayor Crisati. Four. And uh, Councilor Despard. Four. That's uh, seven in favor, three against, and one abstention. Item, item F, the resolution setting a public hearing to revise a fair rent commission to ordinance to conform with state law. Uh, Ellen, can you just give a quick overview before I read the uh, recommendation on this? Sure. So Enfield actually has a fair rent commission. It's been um, defunct for a few years because there's not really an avenue for complaints or 
a lot of activity. It's starting to pick up. So what we did internally is compared the existing fair rent commission ordinance that you have and asked attorney Serrato to make some changes to it so that it flowed better in terms of what the state law now gives you the town of Enfield power to do. So this revision that you have, well, you have both. You have the existing one that is in your books, your ordinance books right now, it's marked existing, and then you have proposed, which streamlines it. So we're recommending that you take the proposed Fair Rent Commission language here tonight and set it for a public hearing at your next meeting and revise the ordinance accordingly. Okay. Uh now, therefore, it be resolved the Enfield Town Council will hold a public hearing in the Enfield Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, on Monday, June 19th, 2023, at 6.55 p.m., submitted by Town Manager Ellen Zappusasu. Councilor Mangini, and second by Deputy Mayor Sakala. Uh, discussion, uh, Councilor Ludwig. With all, all due respect to uh, Attorney Serrato, I get a key point here when you look at this, and, and again, I, I like to be specific, and it's an, it's an appointment of other members. The point, the purpose of this committee was, to, again, fair rent, right? So you have representatives of both tenants, and we spell it out in the original two tenants, two landlords, and then three people from the general non-landlord tenant. It's not spelled out in the new proposal. And if it's not spelled out, as we know years later, it's based on legal uh, interpretation. Uh, sorry, I'm being honest here. Yeah, that actually, unless I like the original fair rent, it's a lot more detailed. And we, and on section B of the proposed under section 2 150 5152, in section B, it has to be spelled. If we're going to go to five members, it should be two tenants, two landlords and one person from the general public. I think we have to spell it out because this once this moves path, it's in, based on interpretation. If it's not specific, we can put, again, depending on what the, that council is at that time, could put five landlords on, could put five tenants on. The purpose is fair rent. And sorry, I, this may not be a big deal in the scheme of things, but as we're talking about developments in town, Right now, folks are paying close to $1,300 for a one-room one apartment in this town. So things are becoming unaffordable even for one-room apartments. In my opinion, this is a big deal. So I may be in a minority, that's fine. But I, I can't set a public hearing not in agreeing with the new language. We have to spell out exactly who's going to be on that committee. It has to be spelled out, in my opinion. It has to be two, I don't, five, it has to be equal between a tenant a landlord and then and if I, um, five members is fine. But I, I'm sorry, I, I can't support it as written. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hopkins. I, I appreciate Councillor Ludwood's thought here. Um, my concern is I, I would like this to be a functional committee. It's very important. Uh, Infield, in a sense, has been ahead of the curve in that we created it many years ago, but you know, it hasn't been staffed. Perhaps part of that reason is we can't find enough people to fulfill each of the categories. Um, I think the council should think long and hard. Hopefully we, we do, in fact, create this because it's a legal obligation, but the council should think long and hard with putting folks on there. I think there should be a balance. Um, if we do it, as written previously, I worry that maybe it'll be hard to fill all those positions. But I think, and, and I very much look forward to seeing applications for this and creating some kind of balance through the council. Now, this council will not be the council forever. There may be different councils in the future. Um, I think there's a remedy for that if, if you know, one side decides to stack it with a particular kind of person or the other decides to do that. Um, I think people can come to, to meetings and call that out. I think that's the best way to go forward to have a functional committee. I worry that if we do that, we just won't have a committee that is actually have enough members to meet. So thank you. I mean, I, I just so my only rebuttal to that is that, again, it's interpretation. And no, no one knows what that council will be. And if it's all you're doing is spelling it out, it's all you're doing. And it's supposed to be fair between the tenants. The landlords deserve it. And so does, and that, I mean, to sit there and say, well, at that point, it's too late. It's already set up. And then you you can't take it back. 
So I understand your point, but I'm sorry. I, in my opinion, it needs to be spelled out. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, just point of order. Yes. It, we're just setting a public hearing, right? That's You're not all voting we're doing. on the language, that's, so you can well, debate it on the 19th and set then. A public hearing, you don't agree to the language. Well, because then you hear more comment, you debate it, you, you hear from the public, and then when it comes back to you to approve it, you could amend it. Correct. We're, we're just setting up a, a, a public hearing. We can always make amendments to who we're going to have as our five-person commission. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Councillor Pisner. So, I'm fine with five people. But what, he's, what Councillor Ludwig's trying to say is that we should define how many renters, how many landlords, and how many <laughs> citizens. That's all, just like the prior one. So you don't have a stacked deck. So you don't want four landlords and, and one tenant. You don't want five citizens. You want an equal amount. So all we're asking for is that that wording be put in so that when we have the public hearing, people read this and understand what we're asking for. That's my suggestion. Okay. Councilor Nelson. Okay, so the Fair Rent Commission. So now the town of Enfield is gonna dictate to the landlords how much they can increase their rents. Do you realize the tax increase you just gave to every single homeowner in this town exceeds by three times the amount that you can legally raise somebody's rent? But you did that to them. And do they have a commission they can come and cry to? So now you're going to go into private people's livelihoods, their investment properties, and you're going to raise their rent on a four family house. The rent will go up two grand a year. For them to compensate, they got to raise the rents on the tenants. But you can't, because you got a fair rent commission that's saying you can't raise the rents that much. How wrong is that? If people don't like their rents, they can move. And the landlord will have no tenants. He has a choice. He either goes to market value for his apartments, fixes them up because he's a slumlord, okay? But the town should not be involved in dictating what private development does. You know, the problem with Thompsonville is this town. We haven't enforced our housing ordinances down there. And we have so many slumlords that take advantage of these people. And that's wrong. And I've said it in leadership and I'm saying it to you guys now. Rich Metcalf, he did a great job when he was here years ago. But it kind of dropped off. You know, we need to get in and we need to start violating these people and getting fines that mean something. Shut them down. Put their tenants in hotels for months until they get their units up to speed. That's going to make the difference in Thompsonville, not building 70 more units. So I'm not in favor of us dictating what a landlord can charge for rent, especially after we raise his rent or his cost $2,000 a year. How do you do that? It's not right. Uh, Councillor Despard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. With all due respect, Councillor Nelson, your argument is with the state because this is the state is forcing this, right? We have to have something on the books. Yeah. So, like, whether we like it or not, we're here. It's on the books, Matt. And how's it doing? I let you finish, it's Ken. Let it's on I, the books. I let you finish. So, with that being said, why not let the, let the public have some input here? Uh, like uh, Attorney Talberg said, we're just setting a public hearing. Like, let's debate this more at another time after the public has weighed in and maybe let them decide what they think it should look like. Like, let them have as much input as they, as they can, right? So I just don't know why we're doing this stand right now at 10.07 on Monday, right? Like, because you're a council member. Not necessary. Care, excuse me. It, but it's it, not necessary right me. now. And you can't right. stop uh, interrupting uh, me. That's, right. that's not okay. Excuse me. I'm, I'm going to have a, a little time out here. If we're, if we're going to, one thing that I probably should have said at the beginning of the meeting is, you know, our, our decorum here. Enough is enough. If somebody's on, uh, saying something on the floor, let them finish it. Be respectful to one another. You can agree to disagree. The only thing that we're doing right now is setting a public hearing. We're not analyzing the, the final copy of what this uh, ordinance and how many members or five members and who's going to be on this. That's something that we can discuss. We're going to set a public hearing. Let the people 
say what they have to say in regard to this particular ordinance, and then we can proceed forward with it. We're just setting a public hearing here. I'm, I'm finished. Thank you. Uh, okay, okay, Bob, let but, me uh, go oh, back at you because just, just you hold, always hold shut us down. They call us out all I'm the not, time I'm by not, name. I'm not I shutting anybody I disagree with Councilman down. Nelson. Not once have I no. called any of them out by name. They call me out by name, well, so I will retaliate. Well, and you need you to start putting them in their place no, when they call no, us out you're, by I'm name, gonna Bob. I'm going to put you in your place right now you because tried. you're, you're out luck. of line. You're out of line. You're out of line. They call me out. I'll call them out. Point of order. Enough. Councilor Up, no, we're gonna, we're moving forward. <laughs> Councilor Finger. Right. Thank you so much, Mayor. So on the FS says in order to conform with state law, can we get what the state law says on that? I mean, is it is it part of this package? I yeah. Didn't see Cal that. Councilor Finger, if I may jump in. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Cut you off. Oh, no, come on. No, no. Go ahead. Go. Exhibit F, Public Act twenty two dash thirty. Plug that in the Google, it'll pop up. All, all towns were required to have a fair rent commission by July 1, 2023. So, so, so do you think we should have that state law printed out for the people who come here for the public airing? Sure. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, should we? Just make it right? For something? Sure, we can Plan do that. Yeah, have that's it easy be available. Yeah, Absolutely. that's funny. We should, right? Sure. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Sheila, roll call, please. Councilor Finger. Against. Councillor Hopkins. For. Councillor Ludwick. Against. Councillor Mangini. Whoops, sorry. Um, Councillor Nelson. Against. Councillor Pisner. Against. Councillor Santanella. For. Councillor Ungeyer. Against. Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala. For. Mayor Crisati. For. And Councillor Despard. Four. Okay, that's six in favor. No, five, five. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Hang on. Can we make a motion? We have four against. We have five against. One, two, three, four. Oh, Doug said no. I'm sorry. Sorry, Doug. I misheard you. That's five in favor, five against, and one um, has left. One's in the, in the bathroom. Motion fails. Um, Moving on. Waiting for a vote. It's, it's not closed. I didn't close. She, she just, did. She did roll call. We have another vote coming in. Four. That's six in favor, five against, and yeah, six in favor, five against. Item. <laughs> item G. Discussion resolution, the resolution to approve a tier collective bargaining agreement with AFSCME Council number four and local 1029. Uh, Steve, want to give a little overview to this? Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. A uh, little background here. The former clerical union, 1303-359, uh, uh, dissolved and was merged into the current uh, local 1029 union. So um, there was a little bit of delay in negotiating because I don't know who I was negotiating with. So once they, uh, both unions voted to dissolve and merge with the 1029 union, I was um, able to start commence negotiations. Uh, I'm really particularly proud of this uh, negotiation because there was a lot of give and take and a lot of listening on both sides. Um, many of these uh, employees live in town. They watch the wage adjustments that have gone on with the prior contracts, the prior groups of employees, and this was the last holdout of the largest group of employees that hasn't had any adjustment. But I said to them, if, if you want more money, you're going to have to help me pay for it. And they rose to the occasion. Uh, we looked for efficiencies, and we found them. Unfortunately, it meant removing positions. Some of them were filled. Um, I had to give out two layoff notices last week, but that was what the general uh, group of employees agreed to do uh, if they were going to absorb some of these responsibilities. 
in addition to um, spreading them out with technology, with a phone tree, uh, things like that. So uh, we went from now seven unions down to six unions in this time. Um, 33 members in that union is now down to 27 because I pulled some people out of the union or I brought them into a higher uh, uh, professional technical union, which means that they have to get training now. They'll be working in Sheila's office. Um, we really open up uh, the, uh, uh, our thinking and, and um, collaborated and we brought some efficiencies to the town. So uh, for a two-year contract, this town is only paying $81,125. Uh, for this uh, two-year contract. And in fact, the first year we have savings because we didn't fund, we didn't fill one of the positions. So they worked hard. Uh, we worked hard together. Um, the only thing we discussed was wages. Everything else is just current language. I was in the old contract. We just merged in the new one. Um, we'll have to tackle that another day. But um, I was really proud of the outcome of this um, uh, contract. And I sincerely hope that you guys vote in favor of it. Any questions? Or are we all done? No. <laughs> Th thank you, Steve. Yep. Uh, Councilor Ludwig. Uh, through the mayor, to Steve, so I just, how do you come up with 3%? Some are getting more than 3%, or, or are you factoring in the reduction of? I'll tell you. So the, so the actual contract, not the reduction of, what is the actual increase? So the first year of the contract is 3%. And the, way, the reason why I use 3%, because that's the percent that the 1029 union was paying so they went to that contract so yeah. that's what they're going to get yeah. they saw what they're going to they got that the last year of the contract which starts july 1 uh 2023 um i now merged it with the 1029 contract to coincide at the yeah. end of that contract that's where the wage adjustment comes in and that's where we also eliminated um the positions so what's the actual increase for two years, the actual increase. So the first year of the contract, the town had a savings of thirty-three thousand five hundred ninety-seven dollars. No, the second year was a percentage increase in salary for, for both years. Minus oh. take take the salary reductions out of it. I mean the salary, the positions that are I'm saying the actual contract itself. Um, I didn't factor. I'll give you the numbers if you want to do the math. Uh, it's three percent is the first year of the contract. The second is five thousand roughly. Uh, Give or take, some are higher, Percent. some are higher, okay. and some are lower. But right, no, that's what I'm saying. What's the overall two-year impact? That's what I'm asking. Uh, I don't want to do math under pressure here. Um, all I know is the overall cost is eighty-one thousand one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Uh, it's uh, probably uh, more, uh, probably six percent. I don't agree with it all. I just I, again, we need to be transparent with the public with the actual yep. increases. With the, the numbers contracts. are transparent. Yeah, the actual dollars. Okay. Um, and I think this was factored into the the budget when John did the budget, but. Um, Okay. Okay, the, the resolution resolved that the Edfield Town Council does hereby approve the two-year collective bargaining agreement between the Town of Enfield and the Aspie Council for local number 121029 Union, the clerical division, dated July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024, date prepared May 31st, 2023, prepared by Stephen Belinda. So moved. Councilor Mangini. Okay and a second by Councillor Despard. Any discussion? Councillor uh, <clears throat> Hopkins. Just briefly, I, I am a member of AFSCME. Um, I'm not affected by this, and I've not spoken with any members of AFSCME about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sheila, roll call. Uh, Councillor Finger is abstaining. Councillor Hopkins. Four. Councillor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Nelson. Four. Councilor Pisner. Against. <clears throat> Councilor Santanella. Four. Councilor Ungeyer. Four. Councilor uh, Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Mayor Crisati. Four. And Councilor Despard. Four. That's, um, sorry, nine in favor. It's getting late. My math is not working. Nine in favor, one against, and one abstention. Okay, uh, the next one is the follow-up to the public hearing we had earlier to correct, correct the previously adopted ordinance, and this is item H, the resolution for technical revisions to the Enfield Town Code Section 82-41 parking violation fines. Now, therefore, it be it resolved that the Council hereby adopts the revisions to the Enfield Town Code Section 82-41 Parking Violation Fines, date prepared May 30th, 2023. So Councilor Mangini second. and is second by Councilor Santanello. 
Any discussion on this? Sheila, roll call. Councilor Finger. Four. Councilor Hopkins. Four. Councilor Ludwig. Four. Councilor Mangini. Four. Councilor Nelson. Four. Councilor Pisner. Four. Councilor Santanella. Four. Councilor Ungayer. Four. Deputy Mayor Sakala. Four. Mayor Crisati. Four. And Councilor Despard. Four. Eleven in favor, none against. Okay, next. As uh, previously discussed and as noted in the independent review, uh, the town needs to adopt the open space ordinance under the PA 490 state law. Um, I know uh, the town manager gave us information about the guidelines and recommendations as to how we're going to move forward and that the plan of uh, conservation and development has been formally adopted. Once again, the goal here is to get this done. Uh, before October 1st, 2023, uh, uh, for the grand list that's going to be signed. This is item I, the resolution concerning the adoption of an open space ordinance under PA 490. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Town Council refers the creation of the open space ordinance to the Conservation Commission for their recommendations. Further, uh, it is the recommendation of the town manager that count, that council leadership assign two council town council members to work with the conservation commission and serve as liaisons between the two bodies concerning the parameters for this ordinance and the assessor shall be named as the staff liaison to be relied upon for technical assistance so councilor mangini and a second by deputy mayor sakala uh discussions we'll first go with councillor ludwig thank you and again i i want to thank you for bringing this again I, I i'm not trying to be disrespectful i promise but this isn't the com so i my point i think th th this is something the entire council should be doing i appreciate trying to limit people people's workload but the conservation commission did give us a resolution um i would rather do it again i'm Maybe it's going to be a busy summer, but to me, this is the one of the, if not the most important thing we're going to discuss. I would rather meet with the Conservation Commission. They're meeting next Tuesday. Um, as a council, whoever wants to show, I appreciate you know the liaisons and stuff, but I would rather ha hash it out. There's I have ideas. I'd rather hash it out in public, and in a meeting, it's public meeting, and then have a public hearing because I think this. I agree with you. The time is short. I like this done in the summer. And I understand folks want to take, and I'm not, but for me, this is, in my opinion, because we did this back in September, I understand it took time to get through planning and zoning, but I don't want the, I'm sorry, for me, it's funny, I, this is what I want, but the resolution isn't what I, I, I was looking for. I think we should reach out to, con my opinion is reach out to the Conservation Committee, maybe they'll invite us to their meeting, hash it out next Tuesday, set up a public hearing, and because there, there's a lot of issues here, that are important, both the 490 open space and there's and there's I mean for me there's other things I'd love to discuss with conservation, and I think the Farm Bureau person is going to be there next week as well I believe, or they can request we can do this all in one meeting, and I would rather do it that way than send it to liaisons and because I want to have a say and I want to be able to debate it in public, so people see this because I think. And again, I'm just only speaking for me. This is the most important issue going on for me in town. Okay, that's just me. And I want to do it in public, and I want to do it with the Conservation Commission. Commission, I know them. I'm not speaking for them at all. But I know they've been working on this for years. And so I don't want to push it back to them, have a liaison. No, let's just hammer it out in public, get it done, and show what happened tonight with some of the, as we talk with, you know, eventually talk with BAA. Let's just get it done. And that's just my opinion. I mean, I can't support the resolution that it is, even though I asked for this to be on the on the council floor. So I guess I'm in a tough position here. But I would prefer that we have a meeting next week with conservation. Thank you, Council Councilor Hopkins. Um, I I do support sending this to the conservation committee uh, initially. I, I think they they mean business. Uh, we we've heard them a, a number of times on a number of issues relating to conservation. Um, to Councillor Ludwig's point, I think, you know, we have the opportunity once we get that recommended resolution back, we can have that discussion debate. Um, I understand there might be a preference beforehand. I don't think that's wrong necessarily, but I don't see any issue with this. Um, 
you know, something that it was interesting that came out of the investigation report is uh, a lot of detail about open space designations. I think there's an argument that um, the town blessing the plan of conservation uh, does endorse uh, uh, conservation, uh, oh, excuse me, open space uh, exemptions, but let's completely uh, quiet the issue and have a uh, open space resolution so that folks can get their exemptions fairly. Thank you. Oh, okay. my apologies. One Thank other thing. Um, I would also uh, raise the amendment. The very last sentence of this uh, is the assessor shall be named as the staff liaison to be relied on for technical assistance. I would uh, suggest the amendment, the assessor or a member of the assessor's office. Um, this comes out of, you know, some friction between the assessor uh, and other committees that I've heard about. Alternatively, if he's not available, I think it would make sense uh, depending on what the preference is for the town manager. That's my uh, amendment. Councillor Despard. Do you, wait, are you making that amendment? Yes. Okay, okay. I will second your amendment. The amendment that was made is uh, a member of the assessor's office will be named as or a member of the um, assessor's office, and that is a motion by uh, Councillor Hopkins and is second by Deputy Mayor Scala. Uh, discussion on that? Uh, Councilor Ludwig. So again, my point is this is a council decision, okay? This should be our policy we, in, it, we put in. And if we just meet with the Conservation Commission, we don't have to worry about having anyone in the committee. I mean, all we're asking is let's meet with the Conservation Commission and hammer it out ourselves. We're the policy-making board. Mike, I'm point of, just no. point of, we're just I know, but you're, you're making an amendment. amendment. But am I saying you don't even have to make the amendment. That's my point. Okay. If we just say, look, we're willing to meet with okay. the Conservation Commission next week. All right. Th thank you. But, uh, uh, do you have a counselor? You have something I want to say, but yeah. do we have to vote on the amendment first? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. So uh, all in favor of the amendment? Against the amendment? I abstain. I abstain on this because, again, and abstain. Right. It failed. Okay, the amendment fails. Okay. Policy. Okay. Councillor Nelson. Uh, excuse no, me. I actually was the first one who had my hand up. No, I will. I will come back. But go ahead, um, Councillor Nelson. Go ahead, Councillor Despard, go ahead. Um, I agree with Councillor Ludwig. I think this is the most important work. And I agree with Councillor Hopkins that we can send this to the, the Conservation Commission. We can have liaisons. You could be a liaison. We, we could work it that way. And then it's going to come back to the council. We're still going to have our say. So I, I, I guess I, I agree with you. Incredi probably the most important thing we're doing. I, I just think we're still going to have our say even keeping it this way. But I, I hear you. you, you make a valid point too. So I'm not like, yeah. Um, and then I just want to say, I know it's not relevant, but I did not intend to uh, call out Councillor Nelson and I apologize if it if it uh, offended you. It was not my intention uh, and, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Any other, uh, Councillor Nelson? So my question through the mayor to the town manager, when was this originally brought up to this council or the council before for that matter because it was before I got here I'm not I'd have to go back and look at the minutes but I believe that the town council referred it to the planning and zoning commission in the fall I think it was the second meeting of September yes no, no, no. that's when we referred it to them right so but they before that I believe councilman Ludwig, Ludwig had been trying to push this forward but my point is, so we sent it to planning and zoning in the fall. We're about to enter summer. We just got it back, and now we're going to send it out again. And again, our taxpayers are going to get tied up because this isn't going to be passed by October 1st. It's as simple as we can approve an open space 490 tonight, same owner, three acres contiguous, then we can sit down with conservation and make all the changes in the world we want over the next 10 years because we're not under the gun for a time limit. But to send this off again is absurd. 
we promised these people we we're going to make a change, and now we're getting it, taking it out of our hands again. Why? I have to agree with Councilman Ludwig. We're here to make decisions. Let's make a very simple decision right now, then forward it to conservation with liaisons and everything you want to do, and they can take as much time as they want. Here we are again at the last minute getting something crammed down our throats. Well, I, I don't. Well, the plan of conservation and development was officially had an effective date of May 30th. So the memo that's on the back of the resolution from the town planner states that. And the action that was included in the POCD states that, quote, the entire area of the town should be eligible for PA 490 designation. And in this way, the commission felt that the council and others would not be limited by the POCD as to the potential scope of any ordinance they ultimately developed and adopted. I, again, I was just trying to be helpful. The Conservation Commission has a uh, area of expertise and is is chomping at the bit to get this done and are motivated. Agree. And you have a lot going on. So if you want to work together, you want to do whatever, that's fine. We're not under the gun quite yet, but I would like to see this drafted by mid by by your august meeting i think in order so that we can circulate it out to the public there can be feedback from the people who might take advantage of it and it could be tweaked public hearing and adopted before before october 1st the application period runs from october uh i think it runs september into october for application so my point is we have one meeting left till august Two. No, there's there's two there's two meetings left, and if it, can, and if there needs to be a special meeting, we'll, we'll have a special meeting to make sure that this is this is all set. Um, you know, once again, I, I am in favor of uh, getting this done. I am in favor of uh, the two council liaisons to be able to work with the commission, and you're going to be right front and center with them. Uh, you can decide who who we want to be on on this as liaisons and and, and move move this forward. You know, we, we do have a couple of meetings before um, October. We have more than two. Councilor Santanella. So uh, this is a suggestion because there's passion for this. We all agree this needs to be done. If somebody, do we want to table this? If somebody wants to take this up, we have a meeting in two weeks, and if it's a simple resolution, and then we work on it or somebody if somebody wants to be a, a champion and shepherd it and we just deal with it next meeting wh wh are people okay with tabling it and us just solving the problem sort of offline no i'm i'm good with going through with the resolution to be honest with you, you make, a motion. make a motion i'll second motion to table second there is a motion to table and second by council uh, councilor pisner all in favor of table and discussion on the motion. motion. Councillor Nelson. So, so to Councilman Santanella, I understand. All I want to do this temporary, so we're not under the gun. We we do something quick, get it approved, then continue exactly like Ellen and the mayor want to do. But now we're not forced down to the last minute to do this so by simplifying it i don't want you to think that i meant that's it it's done i want okay 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 that's all i'm trying to be collaborative yeah <laughs> i'm sorry so oh, it's a good idea john We'll, we'll, no, we'll, we'll go to Councilor Lowe, Councilor so, so to the mayor, to tell me, is there a formal request? Do we have to, I'm willing to be at the Conservation Commission on Tuesday if they want us. So I guess their choice, do we make a formal request to their chairperson to see if they'd like to add us to their, or council people who are willing? Because I don't want to wait because time's going to run out. And, um, and I agree. I actually think this should be, again, everything we just went through. Everything that the town you saw tonight, if this this is the one thing that should be in public with us leading the discussion. This is where I understand we're not, but at some point you have to show leadership on an issue that is driving the town, you know, to a point where we're getting to a who knows some if some folks will ever come back. What I mean by that is this this issue we need to show leadership in my opinion on, 
and this is the one we should, and we should be leading it, and, and we have a commission that I think is willing to work with us to get this done. I think this is, to Council Nelson's point, this is an easy one. So, I, I mean, if we can make a formal request, I'd love to be on there, Jenna, if they would like to have me and other councilors who may be able to show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in, in regard to uh, your, your statement, Councilor Ludwig, I think that having this resolution is, is showing that leadership that we are going to be making uh, decisions on, on this. Okay, so uh, Councilor uh, Hopkins. Thank you. Um, I do share the concern that this should be done before October. I don't see anything that makes me think it won't. Uh, if ultimately this amendment fails and it goes through this process uh, as pitched, uh, and it, we don't look like we're going to finish by October, I think it wouldn't be that hard to create uh, a temporary uh, resolution to specify uh, open space designations for the purpose of tax assessment that would get people their exemptions. Uh, I think we can do that. I might raise it or I would vote for it from just about anywhere at that point. I think that's the quickest way to do that. If we, you know, no offense, do this, I think we, we threaten uh, tangling our feet here and really missing that October 1st. Maybe not, but that's my concern. Council. Councilor Mangini. All right, we're, we're, we're getting way too much into the weeds. We got too many layers going on here. The original uh, resolution in our packet is what I'm supporting. It's uh, not filled with quagmire. We're going to have two liaisons, one from your side, one from our side. And as we all know, any member of the council can and should attend meetings but the liaisons are the two reps that bring information back to the full council. It doesn't mean that the full council or council members that choose don't have a say. So I think by adding this layer and that layer, and the reason that I voted against the amendment to the amendment to the amendment before uh, having a member of the staff for the assessor is because I truly believe our assessor is the person we've hired to be functional in that capacity. So I am going to be supporting the original resolution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, just one, one final comment uh, in regard to this, um, to the resolution. The resolution a as is. We could name two no, I, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, made a motion and was right. seconded to take the... All right, yeah. so, okay, yeah, I mean, fin finish the... Yeah, well, uh, no, I'm just, I was going to be, to Listen, move I, forward with... with I'm going to withdraw my motion, and we'll just either vote yes or no on this. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, well, the only thing that I'm saying is, we if we have two council liaisons, you can go to the meeting on Tuesday, get on their agenda, and then get, get the ball rolling from there. So um, we're going to vote on the resolution as is. Sheila, roll call. Councillor Finger. Against. Thank you, John. Councillor Hopkins. For. Councillor Ludwig. Abstain. Councillor Mangini. For. Councillor Nelson. Councillor Pisner. Against. Councillor Santanella. For. Councillor Ungeyer. Against. Deputy Mayor Sakala. For. And Mayor Cassati. For. And Councillor Despard. For. Okay. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. I'm one, two, three, four. Yes. Um, six in favor, four against, and one abstention. Okay. Thank you. All right. All righty. Item 13. Any other business to come before the meeting? Uh, yes. Well, it's not good news, but I just received the latest uh, final town runs for fiscal year 24 and 25 from Representative Arnone. And unfortunately, it looks like Enfield's education budget was flat funded. Uh, there is no reference to the Alliance grant. 
So we are set at $29,823,645. It does not appear that the budget is being voted on today, so he is asking additional questions. But a quick review of the rest of the final runs um, has seen that have um, significant legislative presence and our leadership. Um, East Hartford's ECS run went up $7 million. Uh, Norwalk, which was supposed to come out of the Alliance District, went up $3 million. Small towns like Burlington are getting an additional million dollars. So I'm not really sure what's going on, but when we do meet with our legislative delegation next week, this will be at the top of the list to ask them. Thank you. Th thank you for that information. Great news. No, no. <laughs> no. Um, item 14, public communication. Is there anybody that would like to come in front of the council? Uh, three minutes. Three minutes, Gina. I'm not. Lucian Lefay, 54 Kimberly Drive. There's one group when I talked earlier that I failed to mention. The Enfield High Band and the Music Department for their wonderful support at the Town Green with the soloist for our national anthem and the band for their renditions of the service songs and the two buglers that uh, participated in TAPS. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Hi. Is it, is it on? Gretchen Pfeiffer Hall for Summers Road. So um, regarding the open space ordinance, so Karen LaPlante just texted me. We, we have sent um, a draft ordinance. I'm not exactly sure where it went to, but um, well, then it must have gone to our staff person, but we, we do have something prepared for you. So, um, I don't know if you want me to read it to you. I mean, it's, I won't read it to you. But it's four acres, not three acres of contiguous land. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. And um, I really came here to hear about these, and I guess I must have completely missed the consent agenda. <laughs> Here I am still. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I just... Uh, uh, Gretchen. Councilor Nelson. Can you just email that again to the town manager and make sure so she can get us all a copy of that, please? Yeah, just... Yes. Thank you. For, yeah. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to approach the council? Are there any further uh, councilor communications? Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Do I have a motion? Motion. Uh, second. In a second by second. Councillor Ungeyer. All in favor? Unanimous. Unanimous.